Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the show. Just checking to see if my laptop keeps up with the stream and see that we are live. Hope we are. There we are. We're in. Welcome. Thank you all for joining on another episode of Wristwatch Week. Wristshot Week. Oops, I botched that one. Uh, there's so many of you already waiting, so I want to say hi and get right into it because there are many, many watches on show today. Um, just a a quick summary of what the show is about. Uh, it's simply you email me your watches, and over the course of a Saturday, I get to share them all with all of you. And the variety is just out of this world. So let's get into saying hi to all of you, and then we will get to the show. Ben, Frederick, uh, C.W. Sayer, Andreas, Adrian, David, Philly's dad, Chai Town, Tanku, Reed, Jimmy, Chili Badger. There's so many of you. Welcome. Thank you all for joining. Uh, let me know if you can hear me in the chat. Comment one, as we always do, as per tradition. <laughs> uh, it's great to have you all here. And thank you all so much for joining. I really hope you're well and keeping yourselves well. Okay, you can hear me. That is superb. Great. Wow, big show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Everything from entry level all the way to horterology, it's all here. And I just want to say to begin with, what is What's so flattering and humbling is that I get some really nice emails from all of you just saying, thank you for doing this sort of stuff. You come to this channel to look at these things, to get away from the distractions, or, sorry, for it to be a distraction. This channel is a distraction from everyday life. And I think that's what I've always wanted it to be, a place where we can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the hobby as much as possible. So yeah, there's so many of your names. If I don't call you out, um, it's not on purpose. <laughs> it's just so many at once in the chat. And uh, there was a question. I see Adrian saying two hours show today. It's probably going to be three, actually. Uh, there's there's like 130 images. We're going to. I'll be a bit faster with going through all the all the image, all the watches. Uh, but depending on how it goes, we'll see some great stuff. Okay, let me just start. There's already 80 of you waiting. I want to start by saying that I have a good friend in London who is currently putting a Tudor Black Bay 58 out on for sale. And if you're in the chat, if you're reviewing the show or re-watching it, his username for Instagram is Watch Brothers London. So if you are um, interested in the Black Bay 58, this is a brand new model. It's bought end of 2019. And I can just show you some of the condition shots of the watch, some really beautiful photos. And let me just get through this before we get the show started. And my friend Ben is also, he submitted his wrist shot or his watch for the show, and you'll see it later. I'll bring this up again um, as, the, as the stream continues, but just to get some idea of the condition, if you're interested in the Black Bear 58, reach out to Watch Brothers London on Instagram, and uh, it'll work out perfectly. Only UK buyers, I think. Uh, that's, that's what he, he said to me. But it's beautiful. He offered me the watch, and I declined because I am currently searching for a very specific watch and uh, we'll see how that goes but let's get to the show because there's a lot of watches on offer so pulling up the main screen if you look to the left of the screen you will see and i'm just refreshing my laptop to make sure i'm keeping up with the stream on the left side of the screen you will see the list of watches that are going to be spoken about and <laughs> there's a lot of them uh, so i'll be slow and methodical looking at all of the the tiny details uh, but if I do need to speed through some of them, I might. Who knows? We'll see how it goes. It's just going to be a nice time for all of us to sit back. So kick back, get something good to drink, and let's enjoy it. And Ryan's saying this watch on screen is a beautiful thing. If you'd like to get me more directly, tag me at IDGuy in the chat, as always, and hopefully I'll be able to see it. Most of these shows are, are normally presentations more than um, your typical uh, in, you know, what, interaction streams. So I'll try my best. But anyway, uh, Shy Town, yes, I got your wrist shot. Uh, it was awesome. Don't worry. It's all saved. I've tried my best to keep on top of everything. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, Hans, welcome. Thomas Burnett, crappy. Great to have you. Chili Badger, founder time is capital. It's so good to have you all here. I really hope you're all well, keeping yourselves uh, healthy, taking some extra vitamins, uh, Supplement on vitamin D. That's something that's not spoken about much, but vitamin D is really good for immunity, great for your brain, uh, very important. So I've just literally, I've almost finished my double shot of coffee and I'm sitting with water this evening, no wine whatsoever. I'm sober cobra. And uh, 
I don't know, I'm just energized. I love these shows. They are just, the interaction is amazing. The watches that we see, it's such a privilege presenting all of these things to you because it's your, it's your commitment to the show. I'm one who just collates everything, puts it together and shares it. So this watch, this is courtesy of Shri. He sent this to me earlier this week. I would say Monday when I, when I put the first post out about the show. And I said, without even looking at the other watches that had been submitted, I said, this is going to be the cover. The Ming Copper uses an ETA-based movement, but it is just spectacular. And what I loved so much about it, not just the composition and the lighting and everything, but his color of skin mixing with the copper tone is just beautiful. It's so bright and exuberant and flashy. It looks gorgeous. So a uh, very unique watch. And it's one of those brands that, that really got perpetuated thanks to the likes of social media, Hodinkee, other journalists and articles. So uh, very interesting. And it's just nice seeing this, this contrast, this presentation. Uh, I've, I've read in the comments, you guys know this more than me, uh, but this is one of the most affordable in their line, somewhere around $1,000 or pounds. I can't remember what the what the equation was, but it is just stunning. And I thought it would be really nice to start the show. Uh, if your watch is featured on the cover of the show, then it will be the one that is used and spoken about first. Okay, so just before we, I might as well show you what yours truly is wearing, good old faithful. Uh, speaking of which, there's going to be a video about this watch. I've actually done a write-up. I've finished the presentation. It's all done. And it's a, it's a bit of an essay talking about the Smith's Everest and why I believe it to be a gorgeous little love letter to the 1016 and the Everest exploration story. So there's some good photos in there. I think you might enjoy it. Uh, I think it should be coming out Thursday next week. So uh, we all have a look, but it is just gorgeous. I just, I throw it on when I don't want to think about watches. And I think that's the best thing when you're trying to be non-biased it's nice to have a watch that isn't polarizing in the slightest and this does it for me what's another took a few shots and it also photographs so well okay so i want to say hi to a few more of you because i have been neglecting the chat uh and g says do these mings come with a date uh, let him know i really don't know but so many of you submitted watches for the show which is just great because we all get to see what you have uh and it's so nice what i love so much about this whole exhibit is that it's not down to what's hot on the market, what's trending. Uh, it's, it's more to what you as a person likes. And I think that's very important in this day and age. It's nice. It's nice seeing what's, what's uh, liked, but at the same time, it's better. You know, we get a more deeper understanding of the hobby and of the watches that others enjoy when we get to see them on their wrists. So uh, yeah, it should be a lot of fun hitting the water and we will start the discussion currently seven minutes in it's pretty good for a for a beginning okay so first up is adrian chili badger rocking a speedy sapphire now i think he sent this to me last week but i missed it because of xyz reasons there was probably a, a miscommunication i don't know my computer maybe didn't save the image in time or i don't know uh, Mr. C, thank you so much for the super chat. It's a pleasure. We're going to have a great time. And I'm going to try and uh, keep it condensed as much as possible. I think three hours is pushing it a little bit too far. Uh, maybe two and a half hours. Don't know. Um, you'll see. Because all I can say is at the very end, a certain someone has said, leave my watches to the end. And he is the guy who actually inspired this whole series, this whole idea of wrist shot week. He gave me the idea of sharing wrist shots and his watches that he submitted, let's just say they end the show and they're kind of a mic drop. So I think you will enjoy it. So can't do anything wrong with a Speedmaster. Sapphire Sandwich, I think is, it's a usable watch. It's a usable uh, Speedmaster in retrospect to the, the standard Hesalite crystal variant. Uh, it's a bit more rugged. You can hit it around a bit more. I think the movement also has a clear case back. So uh, it's a little bit more, you know, spliced up, a bit more interesting to be worn on a daily basis. There are a few Speedmasters, actually. We will see some 50th anniversaries. We will see uh, uh, some mid-sized variants. So that should be cool. But uh, yeah, let's just carry on through. We are getting slowly but surely getting into it. Next is from Alexander. Of course, didn't say uh, this is all arranged in alphabetical order. So 
if your name does start with W or Z, then sadly you will be last on the show. But, you know, you can always flick through this at the end of the show and, you know, catch up with what's going on. Okay. Giza, welcome. Orange Hand, Williams Watches, Travis, it's so good to have you all here. There's already 100, 118 of you watching. Pleasure. Okay. So, this is a Laurier, and I really hope I'm saying that right. Some of these brands I don't know much about. I think this has an ETA-based movement or a Miyota 9015, but what I loved is the context. It's so nice seeing a watch in the water. And later we will see a sea dweller in the water uh, being used. It's been used for its entire life, and I think it's really great when watches have that little bit of context behind them, you know? bit of narrative behind what they're wearing. So I like this, really like the presentation, nice big crown. I, what I don't understand about dive watches is when they don't have numerals on the bezel. They've obviously tried to keep it very vintage inspired. If I just zoom in closer, we've got a, a semi broad arrow esque handset. We've got an arrow second hand. We've got a date at the base of the dial, which is useful. Um, I don't know if this looks like a gloss dial as well. But I just don't understand when, when brands don't highlight numerals around the bezel. I guess aesthetically it looks nice because it, it blends very well with the batons on the dial. But practically, <laughs> it's not the best thing. Uh, you know, just dig it though. I think, it's, I think it's nice seeing that level of variety. Like I said, we will be seeing everything from entry to horterology. There is no bias in this discussion. And I think it's fun seeing what everyone has to show. So next, this is from Alfonso. A Corum bubble. Don't ask me anything about the brand or the history. I'm sure this is deco inspired from, from years ago. Don't know. But it's very interesting. I mean, it really is a bubble in, in every sense of the word. When you look at the crystal, when you look at the numerals, uh, deco inspired all the way through. That's a really nice looking crown. Technically, it wouldn't dig into your hand, right? That's pretty cool. I like that idea. Um, but it's just, it's so strange and peculiar. I think the size probably measures about 39 mils. Uh, popular years ago, Julian says. Very interesting. Yeah, so I mean, this is the variety that we are getting. We're getting all of it. And uh, oh, this is superb. I think this is probably an acrylic crystal. Uh, it's got some loom. I don't know. I'll have to look into Corum. There's so many brands that I still haven't caught up with. But as it is, it just looks really, I mean, it's the kind of thing that you would expect. A musician to wear, you know, really stands out of the crowd. Okay, carrying on. Again, we're still sitting in A, and it's going to be a long show, so I uh, I want to try and move this on as fast as possible, and then we can just uh, we can see how it carries on. Okay, from Ali. Now this is interesting. This is a rotary, and it's called Rotary Aquadive Depth Fifty. Now this watch, uh, it's an electronic watch. I think it's it's so it's a, it's a dive computer basically. It tells you your depth. But this one has a great story behind it because, and I hope I remember this right because I've got so many emails with stories linked to the watches. This watch belonged to his friend's father who was in the special forces. And he used this as a diver for years and years and years. And it's interesting because Rotary as a brand was extremely popular back in the day. And I just love a depth gauge watch to me is just the berries. It's such an interesting combination of parts. Um, the idea that you can monitor your depth while you're while using it as your dive timer. Great, great combination of elements. Uh, this is just so 70s inspired with the blues and the oranges and the, the highlights everywhere. A um, lot of fun. And you can see it's had quite a tough life. It's had its bezel scratched and scuffed up. Very interesting though. And the story behind it is quite something. So it looks like it measures, it's called a depth 50 but it looks like it measures up to 60 feet, I would imagine. Um, so, so I don't know. Again, these watches are all new and different to me. You can see the cushion case is unique. I like that, that bottle cap bezel that it has around it as well. And you can also notice that the crown is positioned the other way around. So technically it's a left-hand drive, could be worn on the right wrist. Very interesting. Thank you for sending this in, Ali. Next, American Jedi. Okay, now this is a really cool contextual shot. As you notice in the background, he's got a Hummer, and in front we have a JLC NSA incursion. So this is a Memovox-based watch that was used or designed specifically for military forces. Uh, it's a very limited edition piece, and 
I just that the combination is superb. These compressors, I've said enough times before, these compressor watches are real characters of the brand. And I'm, I don't think I'm the only one saying that I wish they were brought back and returned. Um, just because of that, that simple system of being able to use the crown, wind it down, lock it in, and you know, roll with it. And I, again, the composition is great. I mean, you've got a gray jacket, we've got a gray jersey, we've got uh, you know, olive colored gloves, we've got black strap, black case, black truck, white snow. Sometimes these compositions really do stand out a lot and it's just superb. So American Jedi rocking a JLC alarm, NSA incursion, really cool. I think there's only 50 of these in the world, but everybody's so nice. Again, repeating this, uh, it'd be so nice if JLC could reintroduce these watches again, or the style of the compressor case with these crown guards, an integrated crown, crown <laughs> an integrated crown guard that uh, you can manipulate, use, lock down, that protects the crown while also being functional. Interesting. Okay, I want to say hi to all of you because there's I've missed trillions of chats. Mr. Perpetual, Richard. Uh, let's see. I've said hi to Thomas already. I hope you're doing well, Thomas. Uh, Iron Armor, Travis, Patrick. Great to have you all here. Thank you again for joining. I really hope you're all well. Okay. Next, this is also from American Jedi, and it's just a simple Batman GMT taken in low light. I don't know what that is in the background. Maybe it's a plane. Is that a plane? Could be. But uh, this watch is, is now really sought after. It's, it's a darling in the marketplace just because it's been discontinued. And um, I find it peculiar, really. I find it strange how desirability suddenly skyrockets when... Uh, a watch like this is stopped. And uh, personally, I've said this many times that the Jubilee bracelet on this watch suits, suits my taste better. Uh, GMTs on Jubilees really work well, except the CHNR root beer. I think that model deserves an uh, oyster. But uh, the simplicity of this watch, mm, it's not as exciting to me visually. But saying that, it's a usable everyday watch. I think the color scheme on this piece compared to your standard, you know, your generic black dial, black bezel. I think the blue and the black, I've said this many times before, the choice of using blue and black representing the day and the night sky. I just think it's so intelligent. That's one thing about Rolex is they have these knockout moments where they do something like the sky dweller with the annual, uh, the, the date complication of, <laughs> I'm tripping over my words a lot, saying a lot of words. Um, the way the Sky Dweller uses that red highlight on its dial to highlight the month at a time. That's just so subtle, understated. And the same here. Blue bezel indicating six in the morning, six in the evening. Uh, so that section, that section is when the sky is lit. And then from six in the evening to six in the morning, dark. Great, simple, elegant, usable, fantastic. American Jedi, thank you for sending this in. And uh, Andreas, next. With the Steinhardt, uh, oh, what's it called? Ocean One Thirty Nine. This was one of my first watches I ever got getting into the hobby, and they are, you know, talking about homage watches and that aside, they are so versatile. It's insane. You can put this, you can put this thing under the wheel of a car and and drive over it, and this will still perform flawlessly. I've used it running, biking at the gym, smashed it around. I took a Dremel to it to cut down the lugs. Uh, it has an ETA movement, so it's just, they are really bulletproof, but there are a few problems. I think there are some elements that this company could improve on, and they seem to be getting a bit more original with their ideas. Of course, it works best when you're mirroring a Rolex-inspired piece, but, you know, I just think it's interesting how we can, how we can jump from super, super high-end to something more entry-level in this category. But this was one of my first watches. I think I got the 42 mil. Uh, great piece, rugged, reliable. It's nice seeing the ceramic and all of those details. So really nice. Thank you, Andreas, for sending this in. And another Andreas, and another way, another thing is this Andreas is 18 years old. So he's just gotten into the hobby, which is great. I mean, when I was 18, I definitely wasn't thinking about watches. I was, uh, I was more of a party animal going out, enjoying myself. <laughs> Uh, it's funny. So it's great. I mean, starting at 18, can you imagine what it'll be like when he's 25? I think he's going to have a stellar watch. It's all about that knowledge acquirement. Sometimes we start the hobby at, 
you know, we can start any hobby at, you know, 25 or 30. And it takes maybe five years to really get all that knowledge in. So depending on your age, it really doesn't matter. It's just time. This hobby is all about time. Yeah, you know, Jimmy, you're, you're about right there. I was in the same boat. <laughs> and um, so it's great that when he's at 18, getting into the hobby at this point, I wish I started early, Dear Artifact says. Exactly. Can you imagine when he's 23? I think he will have a Rolex by then or an Amiga or something just great, everyday, usable, and that'll last him for the next 20 years. And the hobby, you know, the development of the passion just keeps growing. And yeah, love it. Time and money, Phil says. Yeah, true. Okay, next, this is from Andreas, another Andreas. And it's a Fortis, whoops, Fortis Flieger. I don't know much about the Fortis brand at all. But as a Flieger watch, I think it takes its inspiration quite well, it uses the same elements that we know. I would imagine it also uses an ETA movement. And uh, I think the, the use of the sword hands on this model, this is quite your typical elongated sword hand. This hand is a bit more fat and squat. And the nice highlight of the orange is something. This looks like a very vintage piece. I might be wrong here, but it looks like it's got some patina and wear on it. So maybe it's from a couple of years ago. I don't know. Interesting, though. Nice seeing that combination of parts. And the, the Flieger watch, the, the, the aesthetic of this piece, um, it's such a charismatic watch. It's, it's a pure instrument. And I love how field watches have been able to take this piece T-Swiss T. You're right, Giza. Uh, that means it's a tritium dial. So that means it is pretty old. Um, I love how field watches have taken this aesthetic, brought it down ever so slightly so that it's a bit more casual for everyday use and wearing. Great. So thank you, Andreas, for this. And this is 20 minutes in, and I'm still warming up, doing pretty well. We're going to get there. This is next from Andy. Can't remember which Andy, but it's from an Andy. And it's an Oyster Court, and it's a reference 17,000. I hope I got that right. <laughs> uh, now, the Oyster Court is quite the character of the time, and it seems like people are really getting into it. There's, there's lots of discussions and debates about just how popular this watch is going to be in years to come. And it's because of that uh, uniqueness factor, because it's one of the only Rolexes in courts from that time period. And uh, the Swiss courts movements are a completely different ball game to, to Japanese courts movements at the time. They really tried their hardest. What I like, and this is what's made Rolex so important in this time period and all the way through, was that they didn't just buckle and go full courts. You know, They managed to both have automatics and a whole new segment of quartz pieces. And this is this, this Genta inspired integrated case and bracelets. Um, they, they obviously had finger on the pulse and they knew what worked and what didn't work. And it's so simple. Again, when you think about it, Rolex and their execution, sometimes they just do brilliant things that now when you look at it, you think, oh, it's obvious. But back then, you kind of go, okay, well, they must have really sat down and said, We've got to make this thing look like the hot watches at this point in time. So we've got to make it look integrated and streamlined, but we can keep the same dial aesthetic. I love Roman numerals on a date just. I think it's just one of those very important aspects to the piece. So the fact that everything apart from the, the bezel, action of the bezel is flat instead of domed, that's something, but everything else on the dial is just as typical as you would expect. So these watches are becoming collectible. Um, I'm definitely not someone who's a fan of quartz pieces. Uh, the, the whole idea of a ticking seconds hand just uh, doesn't do it for me much. I like a bit of a sweep, but yeah, it's it's beautiful. I think this, especially this blend of white and silver, it is so understated and clean. And of course, when you wear this watch in the light, you get all that light play at the same time. Beautiful. So Andy, thank you for sending this in. And this is from another Andy, and it's a Tudor GMT. So I'm just going to leave this up while I get to your comments. I see there's a few addressed to me. Let's have a look. Um, Doc BBC, you really rock these live streams. Um, interesting future vid might be a comparison between a Breguet Type 20, Breguet uh, Breitling 765 version. Ah, interesting, because I did it on the on the Longines Big Eye. Really cool. Yeah, Doc, I, I would love to do some more comparative videos. It's all about that blend. I want to try and get the idea of... Um, 
focusing on very specific pieces, but then also having times when there is a bit of a versus. So next week, I'm going to be addressing the James Bond watch. Should he be a Rolex wearer or an Omega wearer? And I, for 10 minutes, I go through a timeline of all the watches he's worn in those two categories and come to quite an interesting conclusion that I think you will enjoy. It's very intellectual. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I go on intellectual tirades. <laughs> And from Maz, he says, really enjoyed your recent video on the Longines Heritage Classic. Yeah, that was uh, that happened on Thursday. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the write-up. Try to put a lot of detail into just every aspect on the watch. So if you haven't seen it, highly recommend you do. It took me a while to prepare. I'll say that much. The write-up was pretty extensive, but it's a beautiful piece. And I truly, I truly believe it to be Longines. Uh, they've really managed to make it their own. Sector dial masterclass. Um, so Longines versus JLC sector dial, purely from an aesthetic point of view, Maz. Very interesting. You know, I, I don't think the JLC. Uh, you know, what's what JLC has managed to do is keep the watch a lot more modern. Of course, I don't have it on the screen, but uh, you can try and imagine. Uh, the Longines is very much directly linked to the vintage watch. So if we are kind of balancing, there's also a beautiful Patek Calatrava that's a sector dial, and it's stunning. Maybe all three of them can be compared. That would be a lot of fun to look at. Uh, but they all have different inspirations behind their, their aesthetics, where the JLC has managed to take the vintage and give it a more modern look. The Longines is almost a direct mirror of the vintage, and the Patek is more vintage-inspired, I would say, uh, looks a lot more like your classic piece. The Patek's beautiful. I really need to talk about that watch as well. Thank you so much for the comment. Uh, let's catch up with everyone else before we get to the GMT. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Dylan. Welcome. Uh, again, if you tag me in the chat, I'll be able to see your comment a lot quicker, and hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to keep up. Uh, Mark P, looking forward to the Bond video. He should really be a Rolex guy. So I, I don't want to spoil it, but I sort of ride the line between both because I think as the brands have developed over the years, they have their own place. And the final closing line, this was more of a discussion. It wasn't scripted so much, but the final closing line I think is very poignant to the whole uh, description of these watches and these brands. And NATO is saying, I hope everyone's weekend is going good. I do too. I hope you're all well, keeping well keeping yourselves safe and boosting your immune systems with vitamin C, vitamin D, omega-3, zinc, uh, what else? That's about it, zinc's pretty good. Uh, hi from Toronto, Doc Baps, welcome. And dear Artifact, I haven't addressed you because, sorry, you've sent a few messages and I, I've missed it. Uh, Eric Bell, great having you here, uh, so cool. Okay, so let's get into this piece, someone's saying I really, I really start absolutely loving snowflake hands, Richard says. This is the one polarizing element on this watch. Adrian says, am I a Rolex or an Omega guy? Wait and see, Adrian. Over the next few weeks, uh, actually Thursday, I'm going to be putting out part one of a video talking about choosing my first luxury watch. And uh, I think you will enjoy it because we are slowly but surely getting to that time when I take the bitter pill, swallow the bitter pill and commit to a piece, and it's very exciting. So I'm not going to give anything away, but keep your, your eyes glued, your ears glued to the space, and um, I think you will enjoy it. Okay, so Doc Baps from Toronto. Uh, I'm gonna to catch up with all of you guys. Cool, so Tudor, the one most polarizing element about this watch, the snowflake hands. And in a way, when I look at the brand now, I, I really wish Tudor would not use it so readily. It would be nice for them to just use pencil hands. I think this watch in particular, since they are mimicking a big crown piece, as many said in, in the earlier video this week, talking about big crown watches, uh, I think a big crown variant should have pencil styled hands instead of a snowflake. It's the one, when you look at this watch, it's the one aspect that polarizes you, whether you should like it or not. Now, of course, it is the, the true character of the brand at this point, and it's what they use while Rolex uses Mercedes hands. It's a brilliant creative strategy from the two houses that they, they do this. But uh, yeah, it's the one thing that sort of divides my opinion because I would love to see this watch with a possible pencil styled hand or um, I, the thing that just that irks me is that the dial itself should have snowflake batons or snowflake plots added to the hands to really give that complete look, you know? But as a watch, I mean, I talk about this, I'll be talking about this on Thursday 
as an entry level watch getting you into the hobby it's just top top notch in house movement extremely affordable when you think about it um workhorse you can bash it around it has like a 70 hour power reserve um yeah it's a killer so great piece we're going to move on to the next thank you for sending this in andy and this is from another andy and now we get to the big stuff ready three two one jlc duo metro duo metro i hope i got that right chronograph now just amazing thank you for sending this in andy it's so nice seeing some beautiful pieces on the show as well. And this is the first heavy hitter. There's a few of them, and I think you'll enjoy it. So this piece has been spoken about a lot on uh, platforms like Watchbox, uh, just with regards to the movement. It's just insane. I don't know if it's a split. I haven't looked. Uh, I've seen this watch being shown, but I haven't seen it in action for a while, so I'm not too sure. It looks like a split timer, uh, but at every, every sixth of a second, this hand jumps, so it kind of looks like a quartz piece, the way it just moves between the parts it's so so crazy and don't worry you will see the case back in a second um whenever brilliant watches are sent through a lot of the times the owner sends a, the back of the watch as well which is superb uh, but it's just stunning i think the idea of having the time on the left and the sub dial on the right it even highlights your minutes over here at the base very unique i mean it is jlc the watchmaker's watchmaker. Don't need to say much about that. Wristwatch experience saying mic drop. It's one of the best. Uh, and Freddie just says one of the best chronos money can buy. Yeah, I agree. It's just nuts. But uh, I wouldn't say mic drop just yet. There's some really great stuff coming as we go through. But it's just so cool seeing this level of variety. We go from Seiko to JLC. And it's just superb. Um, Mono pusher, supersonic hippo says. Yes, and it is. So it must be. Maybe it's a hold to use the split timer and then you release it. I do not know. Uh, but we have a power, I think there's a power reserve indicator on each side. It's a dual barrel, as I'm sure we know. And we jump to the case back. Let's have a look. I'm going to pull it up. And here is what you really, oops. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong thing. And your surprise has been spoiled. So there's the case back. Twin barrel. Uh, column wheel, as we would imagine. It looks like it says how many joules? 60. 60 something joules by the looks of things i'm just reading it over here 49 49 joules okay 49 joules chronograph movement and it's just a work of art all of that oh beautiful uh, these striping what, what would you call this is this geneva striping I'd be very interested in knowing uh that detail um, because there's just so many ways of finishing uh, i love the blued screws and uh, the bridges it's this kind of stuff that really takes my attention you see the, the equal spacing between the bridges over here and over here, how it almost looks like it's been completely sliced, CNC'd around the outside to fit this bridge. It looks so precise and thought about. Now, that's another thing. When you consider that most movements like, okay, I'm not going to bash the brands, but something like, uh, I'm going to say Lunga and I'm going to say Patek with their two chronographs, the 1815 and 5170. We might see one of those two watches on the show later. but we look at this in comparison. This looks like engineering, where I think Patek and, and Lunga are more the spirit of watchmaking in a way. They just want to stack all of those components together. Kind of reminds you of uh, a car that just has wires all over the place that you aren't, you aren't supposed to understand. You look at this and it's just so neat and tidy and like almost too stringent. <laughs> you look at all the details, you know? Uh, awesome. Radial, Cour de Genève, and that's from Dylan. Thank you. Let's do the brushing. It's so good looking, right? As Andreas says, it's beautiful. It's just pure work of art. And I can't see, does that say platinum? It's a platinum watch. Of course it's platinum. PT950. Uh, it's just absolutely stunning. So thank you so much for sending this in, Andy. I think we all appreciate it. On the blue strap as well. Let's just get to the front again and have a good look. Also, I didn't mention the, the texture on the dial. See that? I, I don't even know what you would call it. It's like a, a rough, a rough uh, what would you say, brushed up surface. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Love it. This is watchmaking, as we all know. Next, Ant G, who's in the chat. Ant G knows exactly what's coming up next. And I sort of, I sort of missed it, the opening line. But this is one of his newest acquisitions. And if you follow him on Instagram, you'll see it all. Ant G, please link yourself in the chat if you can for everyone to have a look at because... Ah, what can you say about a Saxonia thin? You know, um, 
love the back, love the back more than the front. Hans says. I think you're talking about this. Does this have a clear case back? It does. Uh, I don't. He didn't send me a back a case back shot, but it's beautiful. And Thomas Burnett, this is a Saxonia thin, not not an 1815. I think he might have been referring to early, something I said earlier. But this, to me, really is what I love about Lunga. I've said this before in a in a past show, where I think some brands can really celebrate their details on the dials. Lunga, to me, in in the purest sense. It's a brand that's able, let me try and get a bit closer for you guys. I don't know how good that looks on the screen. Don't know. Or maybe, maybe you want to see the wrist a bit more in presence. Don't know. Beautiful shot, by the way. And Lunga to me is a brand that has been able to capture the simplicity of their watchmaking. You know, German inspired, just bare minimal on the dial. And they keep the complexity and the details at the back. And I think that's really important. It's, it's a watch that you wear that no one else knows, uh, but you know. It's a powerhouse. It's a work of art, and it's just so understated cool. Uh, I just, I love it. It really is something special. I think it measures 38 mils. Don't know. Uh, Andy, Andy says, the epitome of horological craftsmanship. Yeah, I agree. It is beautiful. The combination of colors, just the, the gold finishing. As we know, the dials aren't just white. They're like a silvery finish, and it's beautiful. I hope, and I hope you're wearing it right now. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful watch. So thank you. We've just hit some great pieces here. Oh, and next we've got another superb watch. Okay, I have actually worn this watch in the flesh, this exact watch. And uh, I'm sure many of us know what this is. It's a Patek 5712 Nautilus. Okay, so I'm gonna get your chats and we can talk about this piece for a second. Uh, beautiful, it's amazing how these pieces just suddenly stack up. We've got a JLC, we've got, you know, it's, it's cool, all alphabetical. You never know who is going to be up next, uh, but it's superb. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So this watch, I had my, I had my uh, sort of restraints about this piece. I wasn't too sure how I would feel about the complexity of the dial and everything. It's quite deceiving when you see this dial in photographs. You don't feel this Patek. Richard, I can say that I was someone more interested in the simplistic version, just the standard blue dial. But when you see this watch in the light and you actually wear it, the, the finish, it's this beautiful burst of slate gray. Now, the divide is really down to whether or not the complexity of the dial is necessary for a piece like this. But uh, I just think it's something. It's, I actually made a video about it, but I decided not to post the discussion. It was about looking at various generations of the Nautilus. And I said that the 5712 really tries its best to take elements from the, the typical Patek dress line and make it into something that blends with the sports watch. It's very much like a middle finger to the idea of that classical styling. Anyway, so this is from Ben. And Ben is the owner of this little Tudor Black Bay 58, which I will pull up in a second again, for those who didn't see the beginning of the show. Ben at the moment is trying to sell this piece. And I will again put his link in the chat for Instagram if you want to get a hold of him. If any of you are interested in a Black Bay 58, I'm sure he can help you here. Uh, Watch Brothers London. So if you would like this piece, if you'd like to get a close look at it, contact them. And uh, this was bought end of 2019. He takes some superb shots. You get a good look. This is basically unworn and he's selling it at this point. So cool. Get that going. Follow them on Instagram because it's an awesome, awesome account. And Adding to that, his, what makes this watch so cool is that Ben is basically my age. He's in his, his mid to late 20s, and he spent years working his ass off <laughs> and finally got this piece for himself. This is his one and only watch, basically. Uh, he's been spending a lot of time trying to hone in on the watch that he wants, and this, to him, sings. It really feels... It really feels good on the wrist. I'll tell you that much. I know it's on a leather strap and that's a bit divisive because most people don't want a, a Nautilus on leather, but it feels solid, solid and heavy. I can say that. Okay, gorgeous. So really nice seeing that level of variety. And there's talk about Calatravas. Uh, I hope he paid retail for it. He's, I think he worked out a very good price for it. Um, he's he's in, the, in the industry, so he knows quite a lot of people. But I love the story. I love the fact that someone at my age can afford a watch like this and you know, really put all your money and your hard work in. He wears this to the office every day. And the biggest joke is no one even notices it, which is amazing, right? He can wear this rocket just under the radar and no one ever says, nice watch. 
uh, it's just it's pretty amazing how how small our world actually is at the end of the day in london hans yes in london <laughs> it's amazing right okay next this is from ben again another ben now this is this really caught my attention this email came in a bit later on in the afternoon today for me it is called a vacheron phidias 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 uh, some some greek connotation there but it is amazing it was made in the, in the early 2000s that's when it came out originally and i love the combination love the size and the proportion this is what really uh, keeps him glued to it this was brought out i think it was a piece that came out just after the 222 in that period but what's really glued him to the watch is just that balance between the case and the bracelet uh, of course it didn't have much of a long run because it wasn't popular but I think it's quite a stunning little dress piece. You know, again, a character of its time, simple, elegant, understated. Uh, I would imagine it's like 35 mils, but uh, really interesting combination of parts. And I just think the gold on gold is something. We go into the dial and we get to see, I mean, this is basically all of these parts. I'm looking at it right now. Reminds me of the Patek, what's it, the 5070? The pre-5170, the, the earliest, the latest version of the chronograph. These elements with the, the stick batons for the for the dial and the hands. 5070, you can correct me there, but I think this, I mean, it's almost exact when you look at the details around the, the sub-dials. Oh, Stella. I think there's something quite unique about this watch. And no one knows what this watch is. But you know you're rocking a little Vacheron. Uh, that didn't get popular, but still just looks the business. That's what I love about these shows. You get these outliers that suddenly arrive and we all get to enjoy them. So really cool. This one, again, I'll say it again. It's it's a Phidias, a Vacheron Phidias. I hope I said that right. Uh, must have been a Greek name linked to it. Okay. So thank you, Ben, for sending this in. Next is from Brian. And Brian sent us mm, the old faithful, beautiful little Z Blue Milgauss. And as that's up, I'm going to catch up with all of you in the chat. Uh, it's great that you guys debate over the pieces. So you know, it gives me some time to do the presentation, which is superb. Uh, let's have a look. Really class, nice size. It's interesting, right? Uh, it's obviously not to everyone's taste, but I think it's something quite unique. Uh, real dress watch through and through. And so now we get to the Milgauss. This watch seems to be on many people's radars at the moment because it's just unique. Thomas Burnett owns one in the chat. And I love the fact that it's it's actually Rolex's only real version of watch in the family where they can be playful with their styling. Um, Milgaus looks like a tutti fruity watch. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, what I what I like, I did a video again. If you'd really like to see more information about it, my my interpretation of how the Milgaus has developed. I made a video called the Einstein Rolex. Highly recommend you check it out because it looks at just how the Milgauss began as a tonograph, how it developed into the 1019, and how this piece arrived being this, this blend of both sports and fun. You know, the use of the lightning bolt hand was something linked to the original first Milgauss, some four digit reference, a 653 something or other. Um, but then the style of case is very much linked to the 1019. And you'll see in the video that I bring these two watches together and you get a good understanding that this is actually in line with what the Milgaus is about over this period of time. And it's pretty cool. Uh, the color scheme is you know, either love it or hate it, I, I would say. But as a Rolex, it's something that really stands out. And this, this color scheme in the light would just blow minds. You know, Adrian's saying the old Milgaus with the honeycomb dial. It's gorgeous, right? Uh, I can't for the life of me remember the reference. It's like a five, three, four, eight. I do, don't don't ask me those kind of numbers, but uh, yeah, really nice seeing just that evolution. Highly recommend you check it out. It was done a good few months ago, but uh, really covers the the depth of the Milgauss line and the ten nineteen. I would say it competes directly with the ten sixteen Explorer. It's gorgeous. So thank you, Brian. Next from Brian, this is a CHNR root beer, which is a real hot favorite. I loved making the video on this watch. Um, I called it something like, what, Future Classic or Ugly Duckling? 6541, Adrian, thank you. That's the reference. That's stunning. Okay, so 
I've, I've said this, I think I say this every stream at this point, but this watch is just that great mash of color combinations that works with uh, any kind of skin tone that is both formal, but also sporty, dressy, casual. The brown and rose gold just works so well together for clothing in general. Now, it depends whether or not you like this style or if you prefer the more uh, historic Tiger's Eye variant, which we've seen before on this, this live show. But uh, I find this, if I was in the market for a Rolex right now and I had the money, I think this piece would be the one I would jump on, actually. Uh, I've always been someone drawn to rose gold and Tiger's Eye. I think it's very interesting. So exciting, a lot of fun. I think it's one of the most interesting and we could even say, oh, I don't know, it, it taps into that old school styling, the old school effect of a watch like this. I'd say it's one of the best that Rolex has done in recent years. Um, and on an on a Oyster bracelet, like I said in the beginning of the show, I think it works the best. Uh, the other variants of the GMTs, I think they deserve Jubilees, but this watch manages to ride that line of being casual sports uh, with that two-tone effect on top of the brown color scheme. Beautiful. Next from Brian, and this is his last submission, 214270, but not your Mark II variant, the Mark I. This piece is probably one of the most easily available explorers nowadays because everyone wants a fully loomed dial, but we will get to this in a second as I catch up with you guys. Uh, I think we're talking about rosy and rose gold. Uh, so TEF says, dream dress watch, VC patrimony traditional, small seconds, boutique edition. Yeah, they're beautiful. I mean, that was one of the first videos I ever made on this channel, trying to compare these, the, the top pieces. I'd love to do it a bit more thoroughly um, in future because they do need more coverage. I think Vacheron especially, you're gonna see a lot of Vacherons as the show goes. Um, Vacheron especially is a brand that I think we can all get into and enjoy. It's almost like you, you have to find this, this section when, I actually don't want to spoil it too much, but really when I've been thinking about this first luxury of watch of mine, um, really taking my head away from what is popular, what is wanted, and thinking about what I really want to keep, and something that we don't do too often. We, we buy something to fulfill the want, and then we get the next, and the next, and the next, and we kind of lose sight of just what we were looking for in the first place. I really hope to hone in on those details a bit more in the coming weeks, because it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a great reveal. I really look forward to sharing my experience with all of you. Okay, so this piece, uh, just talking about the, uh, the 214270, for those who are new, uh, this was the first model that went up to 39 mils and there was lots of complaints like the handset being too short and the white gold numerals on the dial. Now, many have said that the reason why the Air King was popular at a later stage was because it used the same white gold numerals to try and get rid of them. Uh, they, they put it into a different model. They almost downgraded, uh, what would we say? They, they allocated these numerals to the Air King to try and sell them. Uh, because the stock for the, the second generation Mark II Explorer was just, you know, selling so fast. And there is something about the visual play and the light with these. It's, it's very unique and interesting. And again, I'll say it's probably one of the easiest watches to, to grab nowadays in the Explorer line because most want either a 36 mil or they want the Mark II variant. Um, but really, the handset to me, the, the, size, the size and proportions doesn't really bother me that much. Uh, I don't know if the, the issue was with the issue was with both the hour and the minute hand. The minute hand should have been ever so slightly longer and the hour hand should have reached. But really, when you look at it from a, if you squint your eyes and look at it, it's not that badly spaced in proportions. Proportioned. Let's get to it. See what else you guys are saying while I jump to the next. So Brian, thank you so much for your watches that you sent through. This is from Cedar Canoe and I think he's in the chat, but he sent me a boulder titanium have a look at this watch. I really dig it on this paracord styled strap and you can't go wrong with Olive, really nice. Okay, so final time is capital. Who doesn't love the root beer? My daughter has this and my oldest has all rose. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous, James. I think it's, it's just such a interesting blend of colors and one of the most interesting that I've seen for a long time from the family. Uh, for me, the, the CHNR and the Batman are the two GMTs that just win me over. Um, Rolex, let's see. Casey saying, 
the hype Rolex models are not the nice ones. They are just hyped. The nice Rolexes are the explorers, date just, even if they have less hype. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's it's insane just how, you know, these watches have been pushed on platforms like social media to death. And, you know, you open up you open up your, your phone going on Instagram. I love Instagram now for watches because there's just so much variety to look at, you know. And you just get reams and reams of GMTs, Pepsis, uh, Batmans. Hulk submariners and just submariners in general. And you think to yourself, you know, it's it's just so repetitive. And then all of a sudden you find a date just that really speaks to you. Last week's show, we actually had a look at a beautiful date just, just a simple black dial with a Jubilee bracelet, fluted bezel. It was beautiful. Um, I'd love to get it up again, but obviously you don't have the photo lined up on the show. But it's it's that kind of it's that kind of thing. You have to really take yourself away from the the group mentality and think about what you would like. What are you striving for with the watch that you would like to get? Um, so yeah, let's just see what else is going on here before we get onto the next. Our wants don't always reflect our needs. Yeah, I should I should clarify. When I say want, I mean need. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, what is it, what do I say? It's just not a want. It's a yeah. You're right. I did get it right. I said wants, right? Not needs. Whatever. Uh, Phil. Enjoyable as always. Yeah, thank you so much for joining, Phil. This will always be here, and um, it's great to catch up afterwards because it's going to be a long show. We are, we're coming up to an hour at this point, so, you know, uh, we'll get into it eventually, slowly but surely. I'm still on C. That's really bad. If it's been an hour just to work through C, oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to speed up, everyone. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Love the orange. Love that orange highlight, um, the, the beautiful dial. Very much a field watch aesthetic, but uses this integrated case styling well. Look at the beautiful cut on that case. Follows all the way through the flank. Uh, stunning. And the crown is actually offset. I need to have a look at Boulder watches. It's a micro brand, right? Um, yeah, and Hans, I'm not even going to mention the bug on the show at all. I'm sick and tired. The, the way media has been, has been pushing it is just pathetic. Uh, I think people just need to be smart. Treat yourself as if you have it and just keep yourself contained. Try and stay away from public places, all that needs to be said. And boost your immune system with vitamins, eat good foods, and you'll be in good shape. Okay, next. So thank you, Cedar Canoe, for that. Next is Kelso with an Explorer 16570. One of the most underrated, and in our community at least, I think we are just, we are pretty infatuated by this watch because it is, what is it? You know, you don't you don't actually think of it as a Rolex at first. You know, um, love that idea of the white on white finish. The polar effect is something so unique to this piece in particular, and the fact that it's, it's an explorer linked to that whole development of the family. I've spoken to death about explorers, um, but the one detail I wish this watch had was an orange hand. I think if this watch had an, a proper orange hand like the 1655s and the more modern variants, I would be all over it. But in this combination, I just don't like it as much. It's just too much of a GMT for me. I need to see a, a proper Explorer orange hand to really get the bug. But what I love the most about this photo from Kelso is the fact that this watch has been scuffed and scratched and used and worn. These watches just need to be worn and hammered about because that is their nature. There's very few watches out there that you can wear and use. Did I say dyslexia? Did I actually? 16750. I hope I got that right. I might have, might have botched the reference. I get confused. Don't worry. I, uh, I normally say the GMT when I mean the Explorer. You know what I mean. Um, these watches, the Explorer line in general, is a watch that needs to be worn and worn hard. Uh, creeping up in price, Adrian says. And that's the thing. I mean, it's like... When I talk about, when anyone on this platform talks about a watch, you just need 10 people interested in a model, and that suddenly increases its value. It really doesn't take a lot to suddenly push the market in a different direction, you know? Uh, but it really is such a sleeper, really understated. Um, it works well for guys who have fair skin, guys or girls. And it's just one of those pieces that doesn't look like a Rolex on first impressions. Um, so it's just, it's just a gem. Really nice. Thank you, Kelso, for sending this in. And this is from Chi Town, California. I don't know if he's in the chat, but because of last week's Zodiac video, Zodiac Super Seawolf. And if I'm not wrong, he didn't specify, but I think it's the Topper edition. And uh, mm, 
This piece uh, has quite the history. I love the story. Highly recommend you have, there he is, he's in the chat, superb. Uh, this is the first Zodiac I think we've had on the show. No, we haven't. The first. This is the first super seawolf of this kind on the show. Um, this brand really has quite the history and I love that story that it, it began and really pushed itself into its own market as one of the first commercially sold dive watches. And I just love the, the baton layout and the numeral placement and simple, effective. What I love the most is that they've kept that old school styling ever since. They haven't deviated. They've left the text the way it should be. There was a good correction in the video that I made talking about just how I said something like this, this watch brand lost its footing and was bought out by Fossil. It wasn't so much of a bad transition, actually. Uh, the Fossil Group owns this brand, but Zodiac itself has never been a brand that's gone out of business. Um, uh, it's just, it's stellar. Something about this dial is really exciting. And uh, the triangle plots that, made, that link with the hands, you've, if you've seen the video, you know that I talk about all the elements. Uh, very nice blend. And the Arctic Seawolf, is that what it's called, Hoplite? Thank you. Okay, Gem. So, Shy Town, thank you so much for sending this in. It's great seeing this piece on the show. And there was a mention that someone has a Hodinkee edition. I think I missed it. Oh, from Shy Town. Mine is the Hodinkee edition. Is this a Hodinkee edition? I don't know. They have so many. They have some in black and some in white and gray, and you know, it gets confusing. Next, we're jumping to Christian, and it is a simple 114270 on leather. And there's something about these simple little 36 mil explorers that is, uh, I mean, on a leather strap especially, do you see how understated it is? For someone who is 18 or 20 or, you know, just getting into the hobby, I think this as a start is something really interesting. And it's a watch you could wear forever, not even think about. Again, the Explorer line, it's a brand that it's, of all the Rolex watches in the family, I think that the Explorer line is my favorite by far. Um, just because of what it represents, uh, the history it's had, but at the same time, uh, it's so low key and understated that no one would know what you're wearing unless they're in this hobby. Um, so it's great. And this is a really thick leather strap. You see it on the wrist. It looks like a really hardcore, uh, combination, but Christian, I mean, you can't go wrong with this again. This is a one, one, four, two, seven, zero. So it's the last of the 36 mil. It's has solid end links. I don't know the differentiation about the dials and all those little bits and pieces. I don't know if these ha these numerals at the quarters are actually loomed, but mm, it's just a little gem. And since we're there's some talk about the 39 mil, so I'm just going to leave this up for a second, catching up. Philly's dad said, as the story goes, the problem with the 39's handset stems from them using the older handset from old, older handset in the Mark One. Yeah, so they used they used this handset exactly on the 39 size. And it's what's hilarious is that it's not the first time that Rolex has used undersized parts on their sports models. So uh, it's crazy how they get flack for these little things. Um, but in this, in this configuration, the proportions of this size, mm, it's a gem. Casey, thank you so much for the super chat. It's a pleasure. I really hope you're all enjoying this as much as me. I hope you're drinking something great and kicking back and really getting into the mood of things. The first half an hour, I was a bit jittery. I think the coffee just went straight to my brain. <laughs> but now I'm in. I'm a bit more chilled out, relaxed. So uh, as we keep going, we're now still on C, and we're an hour into the show. So I'm going to have to speed up a little bit as we go through, but we'll see how it goes. This is from We Watch Guy, Wisconsin Watch Guy. He should be in the chat, or maybe, maybe he missed the show. Maybe he'll see it later. But this watch, this is a tribute to 1931. This was his first watch, and he's, he's gone through a lot of watches over the years. But this is all you need, man. As a first watch, and he says, no regrets. It's my first watch, no regrets. And, uh, you know, that, that is just beauty. The tribute to 1931 is the way to go in this field. Uh, for me especially, for that design-savvy guy who wants something that's just basic with no numerals or anything, such a sleeper in the family. The tribute to 1931 is the way. I don't know if this is the standard black dial. There were a few variants. There were some with sword hands, others with kneel hands. This really is a 1931 reference through and through. Beautiful Halloween styled strap. I'm not wrong. Lovely stitching. It's got that, that faux patina effect on the dial, but I think it just works so, so nicely. It's, it is the reverso, you know, beautiful. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of guys saying it's classy. It's great. I think it's, 
it's a beautiful piece. Okay, moving on. Ooh, wow. Okay, I need to, I need to speed this up because the, sh the stream is going to go on for like six hours and I don't know how long it'll last. <laughs> but this is awesome. This is from Cole. It's a Blanc Pound 50 Fathoms and look at that composition. Whoa, Magic Mouse. Magic Mouse sometimes has a mind of its own. That composition to me is just mm, spot on. And uh, we're going to get to this now. I want to talk about his aesthetics a little bit. Tribute to 1931 is my favorite by far, Thomas. Yeah, I agree. And it was one of my mentions that I think it would be superb if you got one of those pieces. You know, it's just, it's such a character of the brand. Subtle, understated. Um, David B says, as an experienced Omega owner, I'll be first to admit that Rolex is vastly superior. Very interesting point there. I'd like to, if you could elaborate more on that, I'd like to know more on your thoughts of the subject. Okay, next, 50 fathoms. Now, this composition, I was saying, just the, the way it's set on the wrist and the lighting and the balance, what is amazing is that we just looked at the Seawolf, <clears throat> and there was mention in the chat about how the, the Super Seawolf has that stunning typeface, and the 50 fathoms almost has the exact layout. It's almost as if Zodiac and Blancpain are riding the same design wave in a way. And, I mean, what's to not believe that statement because both of these watches were released at the same time. You know, this watch was being used by military forces. It wasn't exactly commercial just yet. It was still slowly but surely being pushed out. But uh, yeah, it's so cool seeing how these brands are still alive and kicking and still producing these unique pieces. There's such nice elements to it, like, like sapphire around the bezel to uh, mimic that acrylic effect. Not acrylic, Bakelite effect. Uh, it's gorgeous. And on the full bracelet, you, you don't really see this watch on the full bracelet, blah, 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 the full bracelet much. I don't know. I don't understand what all the rain clouds and, and that is about, but thank you, John. That's, that's superb. <laughs> so the size is a big problem. I know there's lots of talk about uh, 45 mil size is big, but what saves the piece, and I know Tim Mosso always says, this watch could fit comfortably on a 13 centimeter wrist. I'm thinking, yo, like how <laughs> 13 centimeter wrist is pushing it a little bit, you know? <laughs> But uh, what saves this watch is that, yes, the watch is basically all dial, okay? The lug length still measures in the ballpark of about 49 millimeters. So technically, it could be worn by those with smaller wrists. It's just, you know, as a practical dive watch, this, this hits, hits the mark pretty well for scale and size and presence when you're using this in the water, you know? Uh, but Cole, this is a second submission from Cole, and this is now him in the water using it on its sailcloth strap. It's beautiful. I think it's just stellar, beautiful scene. Uh, love the lighting, love the color, the contrast. This could be a terrific one watch for someone, you know? And great story. You can imagine someone wearing this all their lives and just having a great time. So it's superb. Okay, let's see what else is going on. Again, if you'd like to get in touch with me, tag me in the chat at ID Guy, and we'll see what happens. Um, just catching up with all of you. What is going on here? I'm getting all these rain clouds. And John, what are you doing? Please, please, let's leave this a little bit more uh, mature, possibly. Um, Final Times Capital, awesome. It is really nice. Uh, it really is that watch that is lined with the brand and the family. Um, anyway, spoken about it enough, and now we're going to jump to Curtis. Curtis might be in the chat. I don't know, but going to get to the next piece, which is a Marathon USMC diver. Now, Curtis was in or has been a member of the Marine Corps for a long time. He flew for the Marine Corps for years and years. And I think there's something quite special about someone who's been in that field and gets a watch to commemorate it. I don't know if these watches are actually supplied to the Marine Corps. Might be wrong. I think they are, actually. Marathon does have quite a good series of partnerships with the brands. And... Um, Sorry, Marathon has a good partnership with militaries around the world. It looks like it has a little radioactive uh, highlight here. So it does use tritium on the dial. I think it's a very unique looking watch. And I, I really, really enjoy it. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. There's so many chats. I'm missing you. Oh, I'm missing you all the way through. There's so many comments going on here. Max, welcome. I think you asked how to submit photos to the show. Uh, I've got an email address in the description of this video that you can send to me. Uh, I do this uh, once or twice every month and slowly but surely getting into this theme. It's so great that we're all being able to send these pieces in and getting 
together sharing these watches. So Stella, I think the Marathon watch is quite a unique piece to the family. It's been spoken about a lot by people in this hobby. Uh, whether it's a standout piece or not, that's up to you. I don't know so much about the history, so maybe someone can enlighten me. Um, but it's just a real functioning utility watch that I think is used by the military, the military and could probably take a grenade and live to tell the tale. So it's Stella. Here's another photo from him. I think this is <laughs> this is him flying a 777. If you don't know, Curtis submitted a, uh, what was it? A 16750 the other week. And he'd been wearing that watch for over 30 years. And uh, he loves flying. I mean, it's his job, but he also loves his watches. And being an, a Marine, it's just so cool seeing this, this story come together. So it's really nice. Thank you. And there's mentioned tritium T100 tubes from Eric. Yeah, that's cool. So this is in fact a tritium based watch. It would be nice to see more brands look at tritium, you know? Uh, sadly, they don't, most companies aren't interested because it has a half-life and it ruins the effectiveness of a watch over time. But there is something about the idea of having tritium on your watch that you don't need to charge it in the light. It just it just kills. Curtis rules, WC. He's a really nice guy. We try and we try and keep in touch as much as possible, but you know, as it is, I get inundated with emails all the time and it's a struggle keeping up with everyone, but I try my absolute best. But this this man flies all over the place. He is a commercial pilot and he rocks it. His favorite watch is a sky dweller. Next, this is also from Curtis. This is his JLC grand. Uh, the reference is 7976, the beautiful subdial. Now to me, the nice thing about this watch is that level of symmetry with the subseconds. There's something about subseconds on this watch that really brings it home, you know, makes it makes it unique. Uh, the fact that you can actually read the time and run with it and see the running seconds at the same time, gorgeous. And I think he sent me a case back shot of it as well. And it's just, I mean, JLC really does hone in on the bridges and protecting their movements a lot. It does feel like a more engineered brand than uh, your standard Hort Horology. We can call JLC Hort Horology your standard Hort Horology maker. No tanks. <laughs> okay, I'm going to catch up with all of you guys. Compass on the strap, Paul. Yeah, you said that uh, right. I didn't, I didn't highlight that. I was going to say it's really nice seeing that little integrated compass. These NATO straps are so efficient. Say what you like about them, but being designed as things to have a compass, to have a depth gauge. You can do all sorts of cool things with these uh, as a complementary element. Looks like he's got some paracord around his wrist. I mean, he's a really cool guy. You can see that this guy has done some pretty cool stuff in his past. Um, yeah, but I just love it. 19 joules, manual wind, JLC Grand Reverso. I think this was one of his first when he got into the hobby on top of his GMT that he got. Okay, next. This is from Damien. And it's an Orient. And I found this picture to be so, so peculiar because we've got a, we've got a grasshopper sitting on, <laughs> on his wrist. I don't know how he managed to do that. I don't know where in the world this is. Maybe someone could point it out to me. Kind of looks like the slopes of Switzerland, maybe. I really don't know, but I just found it to be such an interesting and strange composition uh, how a grasshopper decides, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit on the Orient and camp out for the day. The reference is FAB0B00W9. <laughs> they really got a they really got to fix that. And Curtis is in the chat. Welcome, Curtis. You have been here the whole time. Thank you for sending these in. They are beautiful. Uh, Bambino Mark II, I really don't know. It says it's water resistant on the dial. I don't know much about Orient at all. Looks like Germany or Malaysia. I don't know. I was also thinking Malaysia for a second, but I really don't know. Hard to tell. Anyway, great looking composition. I love this, this setup. And there is a beautiful, I think, supersonic hippo sent me an amazing photo that you will see in a second when we get to S. I've got to speed through these. I mean, geez, the show is going to go on long enough as it is. Next, this is from Dan. Okay. Now, Dan has a 50th anniversary Apollo 11 Speedmaster. It's great seeing this in the, in the flesh. If I was in the market for a Speedmaster right now, I think this would be the one that I'd jump on. Don't know why, but I, the composition and the, the colors on the dial, the use of the grays, the blacks, the golds. Uh, love the fact that they've kept that vintage styled end link going. It's a stellar looking piece. Uh, I, don't, I know that, as we all know, Speedmasters are just pushed out more and more and more. And 
there's like there's more speed masters than there are references you know in a in a single line of text for amiga as a brand <clears throat> but they are it's polarizing in a way i think the idea of having armstrong stepping out of the the module it's quite unique i think i'm pretty sure that's that's a gold motif used inside um, but uh, the combination of elements is quite exciting I think the gray and the black and the blend of all those parts together does look very cool. As a commemorative piece, it's quite something. Celebrating the, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Interesting watch. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, Eric says. Okay, thank you for that. Because, because Neil was on the moon at the time, so he got to take a photo of Buzz as he came out, I'm guessing. I don't know the full extent of the story. But uh, yeah, it's great. So thank you so much for sending this in, Dan. It's great seeing that level of variety. We see quite a lot of Speedmasters on the show and uh, more Speedmaster than actual moon landings, Mr. Perpetual. <laughs> I agree. Okay, so I'm going to jump to the next watch, which is a Datejust 41 from Danny. And I'm going to say hi to all of you in the chat because there's lots of stuff going on. Uh, it's not the, the comments aren't addressed to me all the time. Curtis, of course, you're a trained industrial designer as well, just like me, studied. And uh, he knows a thing or two about balance and design and proportion. So you can imagine that he has pretty good taste with all of this stuff. And it's that utility aspect that I think really draws us to these watches. We like it when watches really have a true purpose, GMT for flying, that marathon for, for the use of being used by the military and all of that. It's great. Okay, let's see what else. Tritium tubes from Curtis. Yes, US, Canadian, Israeli militaries. That's superb. Okay, so catching up, there's lots of talk about the the piece. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. Cyclops makes me sad, Okozen says. He's my keto brother in the chat. So the Cyclops is, at this point in time, their calling card. They're never going to get rid of it. You know, it's, it's what has linked Rolex to watchmaking. And what's great is that the date just, the first watch to have a rotating date. I think the simpler the date just, the better. Another thing, I reckon that the Cyclops, it emphasizes the date, but it also emphasizes the watch itself, uh, the watch's function, should I say. It brings a bit more uh, attention to it. So uh, I think this combination is just stunning. A simple, everyday wearer. Many more people are being drawn to the date just nowadays because, of course, as we know, sports watches are out the window at this point unless you're going to pay double the price. But uh, I'm going to be doing a write-up on the date just in the future, really focusing on what makes a great date just and what makes a more mediocre, average style watch. You know, uh, fluted watches are cheesy. Truth fear says. I think what the date just could do to improve its bezels. And I really hope my chat is keeping up with all of you. Just refreshing to make sure. Um, what the date just could do, whoops, with its bezels, is taper down the overall size of them ever so slightly. Sadly, with Rolex going up in scale and size, everything increases, and the bezel is something else that does too, and it increases that flash factor. The original Datejusts had these beautiful little fluted bezels that only you would really notice. You know, they, they catch the light, but they're not too in your face, you know, too much blinksky, as Hans says. Yeah, and uh, I think that's the one thing that detracts people from it, and then you add a Jubilee on top of it, and it's a little bit a little bit way too flashy, but you know, Flip and Zippo, great to have you here, sir. Okay, Whiskey has won. It's been another great show. <laughs> As a pleasure, WC, thank you for joining. Okay, so I'm going to catch the next. This is from David, a David. I can't remember the David, but we get to see a loom shot of the Seamaster Professional. And this is the slate gray dial. The biggest complaints that has come from this watch, it's down to... There's a couple of elements. I've, I've mentioned that I think the size and proportions of this watch could be tapered in ever so slightly, made a little bit more compact. As I, I did a video about it talking about um, why uh, Omega should reintroduce a mid-sized Seamaster, but use this piece as the backbone and say, well, if this piece is 42, then a mid-sized could be 38 or 39, a little bit more uh, practical for those. It's not completely eliminating those out of the market who want a slightly smaller watch, but it's not catering directly for those who have tiny, tiny wrists, you know? Um, but overall, just as a package for the price you're paying for what you're getting, it's a true workhorse, you know, and taper their bracelets, Hans. 
yeah, I think it would be nice to see that. Again, what I said, I think there were a few comments about that in the video, and I said, well, Amiga never has really been a brand to taper their bracelets for the most part. So it's not like they'll suddenly just change their tact. But uh, it's a nice looking loom shot, as Jimmy says. It's nice seeing that, that combination. I do like the idea that they highlight the, the minute hand in green as well as the bezel pip. Surprisingly, this should also be green, if I'm not wrong. That's peculiar. Um, but the big complaint that seems to be going around is that the watches lose their loom very quickly. And the bezel pip being something that is quite important to use in the dark disappears first, which is not that effective for a dive watch. So I think for the most part, they've really hit the ball out of the park with this watch, getting that development forward, you know, improving the piece. I see Ron the Shrink is in. Welcome. Great having you here, brother. Uh, the helium release valve is a bit of an issue. It'd be nice to see them taper that in a bit more. I mean, it's a nice aesthetic feature that I think makes the watch very unique at this point in time. But at the same time, uh, it's just too big. Everything being scaled up, so the helium valve scales up as well. Change the sword hands and taper the bracelet, Hans says. And the sword hands, I mean, I think they actually call them James Bond hands at this point. It's a horn, flip and zipper. Yeah, you're not wrong there. I've called it a horn before and a wart and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I was going to say something else. So next week, I'm putting out a video about uh, James Bond, Rolex, and Omega, and talk about this watch in the context of the Brosnan films. And it was really important to those films and pushed the professional so far ahead. Omega and, and James Bond has to be one of the best watch partnerships around, you know? Uh, Stella. So really cool. I love the loom shot. It's great seeing some. There's a few more during the show, so we'll get to that now. And I mean, trying to keep up with everyone in the chat. Uh, who would look at their watch in the dark for the time? Adrian says, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's all just aesthetics. You know, you love it. Spelunkers. Good point. The Buganish. Okay, next. David, Mr. Perpetual. <laughs> Maybe we're what, an, an hour and uh, 18 minutes into the show. I hope we can keep going. So he sent me this cool shot of a Submariner book and his standard 116610 with a super case. It's great seeing a contextual shot with the watch, you know, the camera pulled out a little bit, a little bit further back. So we get to see the size and scale on the wrist. Yeah, you can't say much about this piece, uh, whether you are a fan of the super case or not. I think they scaled this watch correctly with regards to its proportions. And the big question now is just what are they going to do next with this line? Um, I have this feeling in my gut that they're going to slowly but surely taper in the case like the GMT variants, put the new movement in and just push it out the way it is. Then there's talk about the Explorer being changed. I did a video a couple of weeks back talking about it. Um, the Submariner and the Explorer seem to be the two watches that are going to be put under the knife this year. Don't know how it's going to be unveiled, uh, Basel World being eats and all, but <laughs> who knows? Okay, so everyone has seen this watch 10,000 times for special. I know, it's like, that's the thing. You keep seeing it and you think to yourself, are we not getting bored of it as a community? It's amazing. The, the enthusiast will always look at this watch and find it enticing. Um, but at the same time, those who don't like the watch, they get sick and tired of it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit on the fence both ways. I like writing about it because I love the history. But, you know, next, this is from Miss Perpetual as well. This was cool. You sent me two shots, I remember. So this is a Seamaster 259. Ooh, let's see, what did I say? 2598, that's the reference. And it's a, it's, there was a mention about the Brosnan Seamaster being better. This uses the same format of the Brosnan era pieces, but has this stunning aesthetic. It's got a, it's got a pusher set. It's a proper chronograph, dive chronograph, white on white. So it has a bit of an Explorer-esque aesthetic, a bit of a, a, bit of a polar effect. Um, and I just, I think the combination is stunning and you don't see these watches. I would imagine this is a late nineties reference. If I'm not wrong, a 2598.20. Yeah, that's it. So it's cool. I mean, it's so nice seeing that variety. I love the orange highlights. Let's try and pull into the dial a bit more and have a closer look. Orange highlights on a watch always sells me on it, you know? The bezel looks almost more scalloped than other Seamasters. It does. And what I think it is, what I think has accentuated that is if I was actually, I, I thought the same way. The way the crown guards link up with the bezel scallop and the way the pushes sit so neatly in there, it's almost as if the emphasis 
is boldened. It's crazy, right? It's crazy how, how visual effects change subtle things. Maybe it's just the lighting in the room, you know? Uh, but the stud, thank you. Welcome to the show. Looks like a bottle cap, Buganish. <laughs> Legibility though, Hoplight. I think that's its big detractor is that, uh, you know, if you, don't, if you don't add black accents or heat blue or something to the hands, you lose them on the dial. And as far as the chronograph goes, you could read it well, but as far as time telling goes, obviously you can see here that the time telling aspect was put aside in favor of the chronograph, you know. Um, but in saying that, it's unique, different. We've seen this bezel on a few variants before. So thank you so much for the submission, Mr. Perpetual. Great seeing those watches. And next, we are jumping to Sky Dweller from David. And I mean, this watch is just, I think he has sent this watch to me before, maybe, don't know. This is one of the coolest modern watches that Rolex has brought out over the years. What about a loom shot stream, Mouse Man says, or Moose Man says? That would be something. I mean, we could actually base the theme of the show around uh, looms. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, there's lots of variety. But then again, I would imagine most of the shots will be sent you know, as Rolex pieces, and I'm sure we would get bored. You know? uh, and David, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's, it's just a stunning watch. And the next shot is even better because it's, it's in a car. Um, favorite dial color on the Seedwell. I agree, Thomas. I think of all, the, of all the colors, the two colors that appeal to me the most, black and this beautiful sunburst blue. Um, and it's, it, it's very flashy. I mean, there is a lot of flash factor. I think I said in the video when talking about the Sky Dweller that uh, because it is the crown king of Rolex in the family, it does deserve that bragging right. You know, it's, it's a stellar complication. And uh, that blue, it's just so exciting, you know, beautiful. So that's it in direct light. And then we jump to the next shot. This was taken in a flat four. I would imagine this is an STI. Don't know. Would it say STI on the steering wheel? I do not know. Nothing cooler than a Subaru and it's flat four. Now we see it in a little bit of less direct light. You can see just how uh, it is. It's very, it looks very complicated, you know? And I think Curtis, if he's still in the chat, he has a two-tone variant of this piece. And uh, yeah, it's just a stunner. It's really exciting. It looks like a mechanical uh, powerhouse, the way it presents itself. I mean, this bezel, we're talking about how bezels are just getting pushed bigger and bigger. This bezel at least has a function. You need to actually turn it to adjust the time and the complication itself. But I love the fact that you don't need to use pushes in the case to adjust the various complications like so many other brands. Rolex, you just pull out the crown, adjust the bezel, and you can set every little complication on it. It's a crazy complication. I love, I love that story of the development of the watch. So thank you so much, David, for sending this in. Next, we have Dear Artifact, and he's been in the chat long enough. I think he's still there. Now, Dear Artifact, if you are still there, I want all of you who are on Instagram to follow Dear Artifact, and I'm going to post his link right here in the description, there, sorry, in the chat of the show. Go into Instagram, Follow Dear Artifact, because the photos he shares, absolutely beautiful. So JB Champion, bracelet, Speedmaster Professional, can't go wrong with it. I mean, look at it. Look at the quality of that shot. It's just so, so cool. So everyone, get off this right now. Go onto Instagram and follow Dear Artifact, because his photos are stunning. He has such a simple but thought-through collection, and there's a lot we can learn from that kind of taste, you know? Catalog quality, as Okuzan says, absolutely. I mean, look at it. This could be a proper menswear or men's lifestyle magazine cutout. Look at that. It's just beautiful. Super high res. I mean, he has to send these to me via Google Drive because the quality is just out of this world. But it's so nice seeing the watch in a bit more context, you know, being worn from a distance. Um, you know, it's a skill. I can honestly say, dear artifact, you have a skill in this genre. I mean, is beautiful. So thank you so much for sending it in, dear artifact. I, I love it. And the JB Champion bracelet also, it's that, that character of the late 60s, uh, really ties it to the piece. A lot of people don't like it because it's a mesh, but whatever. I think it looks awesome. Okay, going to carry on. We're still on D and we're an hour and a half in, so I've got to, got to rush through these. This is from Derek, and it is a Citizen NY0040 Italian Frogman piece. I don't know if it's my 
the image resolution of the watch. I don't know, it didn't work out too well, but you get the idea. And he mentioned about the paracord strap. And these paracord straps, I think, are real sleepers. You know, uh, they, they're comfortable, usable. It's nice having that elastic because it's, it's very comfortable. Uh, you don't have to worry about material bunching up on your wrist and all of that. But this, this falls in line with the Seiko family. So, um, you know, that, that family of watch that you can wear every day, beat around, use it, superb. So thank you, Derek, for that. I've got to speed through these because I'm literally only on D and I'm going to drag out for too long. Hamilton Khaki Navy from Driven to Win. This was submitted the other week, but I just love that loom shot. Uh, it's taken, taken in, indoors, I would imagine, or maybe outside, I don't know. But it's nice seeing that blend of colors. It looks very much like a utilitarian you know, navigational compass, quite something very unique. Nice seeing this watch on the wrist. Okay, I need to slowly but surely move through these. Dylan, next, with an IWC double chrono. And as we get here, I'm just going to jump to the chat and see if there's anything addressed to me. But that is a beautiful shot. You very seldomly see this watch. Um, let's see for a second. Adrian, thank you for joining. It's a pleasure having you here, sir. I can't believe we've been going on for so long, and I haven't even haven't even gotten through this yet. <laughs> so, Dylan, you're in the chat. That is superb. It's great to have your bit of context in the story. That's superb. Double Chronograph was gifted from an IWC ambassador, buddy of mine, actor celebrity, and I was his flight instructor. That is so cool. And IWC, with their Flieger-inspired elements, either it's hit or miss sometimes, but here they managed to use not only the, the simple numeral layout, but the sword hands. Uh, since it's a double split, it's just stunning. Day date complication, this is great. So I really like this combo. Thank you for sharing. You've got a, a nice heavy duty uh, Zulu style strap as well to go with it. Got a little plane in the background. It's just great context. And I think Dylan sent something else, or is this another Dylan? I don't know. It was a Grand Seiko sent to me. This is the same Dylan. Grand Seiko Snowflake, as we talk about often. <laughs> Schaffenhausen, exactly, Hoplite. <laughs> I like saying Schaffenhausen just because of our main man. Um, Grand Seiko Snowflake, we note as just one of those pieces that is quite a definer. It's becoming more and more popular on our platform because it's, it's in a completely different league to Swiss watchmaking. And people like that variety, you know? Um, and of course, what, what they claim to fame is, is that beautiful effect on the dial. Love that, that finish and the detail. Uh, the cases are also something to, to take in because they do finishing, Zoratsu finishing, very, in a very unique way. But more than that, I think it's that, that squared off nature that the case, ha the case has in the way that it sits on the wrist. Very unique. I like to do more discussions around Grand Seiko. And here's another shot from Dylan, another IWC shot. Beautiful layout. There we go. We get a good idea. It's actually got a sector ring inside there. Beautiful brushed finish. Love the contrast. This is a gorgeous photo. Okay. I'm going to leave this up for a second. Never seen a Grand Seiko in the flesh from Shane. I have once. I've been to the boutique. I think it was a boutique in London that I went to. And they they are, I would say, they're, they're a lot more flashy than you think. Some of them, even in titanium, they, they stand out quite a lot. Uh, the size and proportions, I don't know if they work the best for smaller wrists, but Still a stellar looking watch. Um, but contrast rocks, as Akuzen says. I think it does really stand out nicely. Nice blend of colors and really neat and tidy, compact. Flieger inspired, but has a bit of a modern touch behind it. Okay, next we're jumping to Eric. And this is Eric Bell. I'm sure he's in the chat somewhere. But he sent out some really cool pieces. This is a, an Aragon dive master. And he said something like, for the inner child in me, you know? Uh, it's just. It's just insane. I mean, look at that. When do you see a fully loomed watch on show? Great combination of parts. Uh, it's just it's exciting. And Eric loves diving as well. So it blends really well with his taste. He loves big watches. This is a 50 millimeter watch. So superb. Next from Eric, Citizen Eco Zilla. And he loves his dive watches. The bigger, the better, clearly. Um, we've, got, we've got orange contrast on the hands. A uh, huge bezel. The knurling is on the far outside. Look how tiny the knurling is on the sides here. Let's try and get a better close-up shot. Pretty stunning. But uh, it's just it's just huge. I need to look at Citizen more. Uh, it's interesting. And Aragon Watch Swiss, if if Eric is in the chat, please uh, clear that up for us. Japanese movement. So I'd imagine it's, it's a Miyota maybe or 
I really don't know. But it's, I think that loom shot is just, it's one of the showstoppers. It's stunning. So thank you for that, Eric. And he also sent me just a collection of loom shots from his collection, from his, a collection of loom shots from his collection. Sounds right. We've got some Seikos. We've got some, some more Aragons. I don't, I don't even know. Can't keep up. But he clearly loves his divers and he loves his loom. He really digs Aragon. It's amazing. I mean, that is a loom shot. That is not direct light or anything. Uh, he's got a, a, Roy, a Casio Oak or a, a G-Shock of some kind. Stunning. And we're going to get to a G-Shock in a second that I think is pretty, pretty awesome. Okay, next. This is from our man Fauzi. I hope he's in the chat. There's no shortage of loom brands. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So Fauzi, Tanku, if he's, in, if he's in the stream, this is his Coke 16700. And he's got a stellar collection. Really simple and understated. Wears well. Uh, we've gone back and forth a lot about Daytonas. There he is. Great having you here, sir. I love the context. And we look to the next shot. He's got his little mini. I think this is the station wagon variant. Uh, countryman. What do they call it? Never know. Um, but I just I think the Coke is something that's quite the sleeper as well in the family. Um, it's a watch that many people seem to disregard over the Pepsi. And I think it sits in the same kind of line as the Explorer 2 in a way. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's well known, but it's not something that many jump on immediately. You know, I was right. It is a countryman. It's a clubman. Oh, God. You know, can't even start with cars and their names. Uh, so superb. And then we've got another shot in more direct light. See, it's got, it's got a station wagon to it. So I would imagine it's a countryman, no? I don't know. Mini lost me the second they made their cars look like SUVs. <laughs> I, I miss the early 2000s uh, cars, you know, when they originally brought out the John Cooper from that time period and uh, turbocharged and really made it. I mean, just watch Italian Job, the original, and then the one from 2000 and wherever. I love those iterations of the Mini. Just did it for me. Um, so, Stella, thank you for this. And you can see the condition is just stunning. I mean, this, this watch doesn't even look like it's been worn. I don't know how you guys keep your watches in such good shape. I really, <laughs> I really use mine pretty hard. Okay, next, we're gonna go to the next. I've got to run through these because we're only on F at this point. This is from Fahim, and he goes by the name of King Flume on Instagram. Get on Instagram, follow King Flume. I'm going to link his handle in the chat again for you to look at. You have to follow his photos because the shots he takes, he has an amazing collection. He's just picked up a Jean Resonance. He has a couple of Rolexes, but he also likes to experiment with a few brands, as we will see in a second. Uh, great seeing a loom shot. He takes some amazing photos of his watches, so do yourselves a favor. He's a fellow South African, so he's from my side of the world, and uh, such a nice gent. Met him in London a couple of months back, and we really hit it off well. Uh, we chat a lot, actually. We spend a lot of time talking about watches, and we've been chatting about my watch that I'd like to get, my first luxury watch, and... Uh, it's going to be nice sharing the story with all of you eventually. Um, so gorgeous shots of the Explorer. Highly recommend it. Stop what you're doing right now. Go on Instagram. Check it out. And look at the condition of this watch. You would swear he doesn't wear his watches. I honestly don't know how you guys keep them looking so good. Uh, I just Maybe I'm just clumsy. Maybe I just don't care enough to keep them clean, you know? Um, beautiful. Okay. Just catching up with all of you here. Let's pull up something else. This is another piece from him. What's a good example? So this is a Unimatic NASA. Now, me and Unimatic as a brand, I know less than nothing about. So you might need to uh, include me and give a bit more information about it, but really cool. You're only supposed to blow the doors off. <laughs> oh, that, was a, that was a quote from the film, right? Uh, oh, I love it. I, the, the modern, both the original has its place. It's, it's superb. I think that the action and the driving is something amazing. I love the end scene of Italian Job, the, first, the original. But in 2001, whenever they brought it up, that film was just, I mean, I grew up, I was what, six or seven or eight years old at the time, and I just fell in love with those cars. It has to be the most uh, amazing. Uh, when you talk about like highlighting a car in a film, you have James Bond with Aston Martin, and then you have the Italian job with the Mini Cooper. I think it's just superb. They need to, like, they can't recreate Bullet, but if they had to, bring that Mustang back in, you know? Okay, hate it when they roll the three minis off the cliff. Yeah, Dylan, it's the worst. I mean, they are such beautiful little cars. Uh, my mum owned one. She had a she had an orange one with a with a white roof back in the day. 
My family comes from a line of owning Beatles, Minis, Ford Cortina, Mark Ones. Uh, uh, what else? Morris, Morris Woodies, Morris Miners were a big thing for my family as well. Yeah, we've had some cool cars. And then all the VWs, Mark Ones, Mark Two, Mark Three, GTIs, VR6s. <laughs> The list goes on. We love VW, my family. Anyway, getting back into it. So I'm talking about Unimatic a bit more. Um, let's see. Unimatic is Italian. I really don't know, Giuseppe. I have less idea than a goat. But I do know that this is a special edition linked with uh, the NASA branding. I don't know how this all worked out. I think it has something to do with the space program. It could be just an homage to that time period. Really don't know. Any city golfs in the family, Sheetan? Yes, uh, lots, actually. Jeez, we went through a lot. I would say we went through at least five over the years. Because the if you, if you don't know, if you come from a place like South Africa, you know that city golf is basically the last of the Mark I VW that was made, and it was manufactured in the country. So they were really affordable and cheap to get. And we would just go through them, generational. I think we went through at least three. And I learned to drive in one of the last, the very, very last models where they would quite literally put all the modern components of, I think of that time it was the Mark V VW. They put all those components in a City Golf. And that was the first car I learned to drive in when I was, must have been about 10. And then I jumped to an Audi S3, <laughs> a 2001 S3. It's my, my dad's pride and joy. You can't talk about Golf GTI, Dylan. 2001 S3 was just the way. It's an oh, absolute dream. Anyway, talking about cars, we'll talk about that all the way through. Beautiful piece and follow Fahim. Follow King Flume on Instagram. Great summer watch. Very good. It's a kind of, and I think he had these photos when he was on holiday. It's the kind of thing you just throw on and wear when you're traveling, and you know? Okay. Philly's dad is next, and I think he's in the chat as well. This is a stunning piece. It's called the King Turtle. And Anything with olive drab, it's just stunning. It's also an, a JDM, if I'm not wrong. So it's a Japanese domestic market variant, which means that you can only get it in Japan. I say that not because I wrote it down, but because I look at the date window and I see a symbol there. I might be wrong. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Car shot week. <laughs> that would be cool. Uh, uh, there is. Philly's dad is there. So Japanese reference. I love olive drab. I think it's something so special with a watch of this kind. And... Actually, the turtle, as a brand, we know that the turtle got its, its name from Apocalypse Now, the, the reference 6105, no, the Willard. And the idea that they're blending this effect of the Willard-inspired you know, Vietnam color scheme with a turtle of this modern era, really nice. I think it is cool. Nice blend of parts. And he sent me another one as well, some really good shots. The turtle case, classic. This is when Seiko, I really believe, went into its own. And uh, I can't the reference. The 62MAS was the first Seiko diver that borrowed from the Blancpain 50, no, the Blancpain Bathyscaphe. And uh, this model was really the time when Seiko managed to do their own thing and create something that was really a great in the line. And just beautiful shots as well. Thank you so much for sending these in, Philly's dad. Uh, you, you seldom see this watch in, in olive. It must be a very unique piece since it's Japanese-based. Um, yeah, can't beat an olive dial. I think it's just something there. And we also got a loom shot. It seems like guys are, are really interested in sending in loom shots. So maybe we can make a loom shot show. But I don't think it would have legs because it would uh, it would just be so repetitive after a while, you know. Um, but it's just the classic the classic layout of the dial. You can't say anything more. Philly's dad, thank you for sending it in. Next is from Franco, and this is a beautiful, beautiful Seamaster, near and dear to my heart. Reference 2254. I made a video about this piece, I would say, six months ago, eight months ago. I don't know. But he bought this watch because of the video that I made, and that is special. It really is. I really hope you're enjoying this watch, Franco, wherever you are out there. And... Uh, I think what they did with this, it is one of those sleepers. It's that Explorer watch of the Seamaster family. They got rid of the things that, that really didn't make the Seamaster professional that appealing, apart from the, the helium valve. I think this watch looks a lot more modern in contrast because we have the Speedmaster professional bracelet. We have a fully loomed dial with even a loomed date window on the side, a black date window. 
sword hands. It calls back to the original MOD period uh, from, from the late 60s Seamasters that were made. And it's just, it's so interesting. You could almost say that it has that military heritage tied into the, the brand of the watch, you know? Um, the only aspect that doesn't appeal to me about the piece is the huge numeral set around the bezel. I've said this enough times that I think uh, if you look at the planet ocean, some some modders out there get the planet ocean bezel and fit it inside this watch and it looks so streamlined. But this combination, black wave dial, that's just beautiful. Sword hands, proper sword hands. Many say that they actually would go out and buy the modern, uh, the modern Seamaster Professional and swap out the hands to sword hands if they had a chance. So that's something. Um, Really nice combination, love the shot. So thank you, Franco, for sending it in. Um, and never been bettered, as Hans says. I think, you know, it's bad to say, but it is one of those watches that came out. It wasn't very popular, so it sort of disappeared. But in actual fact, it is a watch that if re-released or if you know, revised in a few places, would be so impactful. Because I think more people are getting into that line of understanding just where it developed and the history what do I think about the new Bond Seamaster, Tim says? As, let me just jump, uh, there's nothing cool to pull up. I'll just leave this up here for a second. The the latest Bond Seamaster, we're talking about the, the one with the mesh bracelet and everything else. I actually began a live stream a couple of weeks back, I'll say a few months, talking, I think it was, if you go into the search bar now, open up a separate tag and type in, what is your favorite reissue vintage watch, maybe? I give a, a description around the Bond watch, and I, I go into looking at the mesh bracelets. I think I do a bit of design adjusting. I can't remember the context fully, but it is on the cover of the video. So, uh, yeah. Um, if we're talking about the Bond watch, this is a Smith's Everest, by the way, an original Smith's Everest. This is from Freddie, Freddie Turner, I think. Uh, I don't know. It's from Freddie, I'm just going to say. Um, they're, they're, they're pros and cons. I think they over patinaed the Bond watch a bit too much. The Spectre watch for me is just leagues ahead when we look at just how, how it's managed to last the test of time. Take those vintage inspired aspects, but also keep it looking modern. Um, so we, we all have a look. We'll talk about it at a later stage. Um, actually, I'm going to be bringing out a video on James Bond later in the, in the week. In any case, next week, James Bond, Rolex Omega. So this is a Smith's Everest, and these watches are still around. It's a, it's a nine carat gold piece. They call it a jumbo, and it's just great seeing this watch in the flesh. Speaking of which, again, I'll say, I am um, I'm bringing out a video on the Smith's Everest, the little little guy that I like wearing so much, and it should be a lot of fun. I really go into depth talking about the details and why I think it has a great callback to the past and the development of the line. So look forward to that. Great seeing this watch in the flesh. You can find these watches all over the show still. They're still very much available nowadays. Next, from Freddy. Vacheron Constantin, Overseas Gen 1. Now, this takes its inspiration from the reference 222. But it is, it's, I would say it feels a bit more dated than the current reference, which we will also see later on. Uh, but I think the, they, they were getting somewhere with this. They were looking at the Maltese cross. They were trying to integrate it into the bezel a bit more. Nice integrated case and bracelet. And then we move and check out the back of the watch. We see that it's, I really like this effect. The screws mirroring the dial. Uh, I can't read all of this, basically saying tested to depth. Uh, really nice combination. And it's, it's definitely a watch of its time. Um, super popular in China. This piece in particular, interesting. Um, it is stunning. And it's, it does ride that line of sports and dress better than a lot of other brands, I would say. The integrated bracelet, the size, the scale, uh, it doesn't look very flashy on the dial. You know, the, the batons, the batons are very much what you would expect to see on a dress watch. So I think they were trying to experiment with a few things. Also really like the use of the font on the dial here, the way that it actually curves, bit of a smiley effect. Nice, nicely integrated. But I think the Gen 3 really has come out of its way and done some, yeah, as Doc Bapp says, it's, it's managed to really pull its punches and show something quite special. So we will get there. there. There is a Gen 3. This is from George, and it's an Oris Charlie Parker. I had no idea that this watch existed. It says bird on the side here at the four. 
So Charlie Parker, famous saxophonist, jazz. He was one of the most influential players. I mean, his. I love listening to jazz if I get a chance. And it's just something you can put on and leave. And he just has his own way of playing, you know. Very, I highly recommend you look at jazz musicians of the early days. And uh, beautiful, beautiful deco effect. I love the numerals, the balance. It's so like graffiti, you know, handwritten on the dial. I didn't know this watch existed. Got a beautiful, did you call it an onion crown? Don't know. Oris does some pretty interesting stuff. Maybe, I, I don't know the, the history of, of the piece, whether it has a tie to Charlie Parker in a way. Did he wear this watch? I know yeah, Miles Davis wore a Navi timer, and that's awesome. Cheat time. It has to be one of the most badass photos out there, you know. Uh, this, this, this is gorgeous. So really nice. I love the blend. And I do often comment on the way that the numerals are placed on these dials with the, the baton and the two baton four. This way, the way it's been arranged with the font and the typeface, it doesn't look that bad, actually. It's quite effective. I think it's down to seeing the, the way the numerals fill the space on the dial that makes it so effective. It looks great. So thank you so much for sending this in, George. Uh, he did say in the email that he doesn't know he doesn't know if anyone knows about Charlie Parker and who he is, but he loves the heritage and the story. So it's nice. I think it's a great combination. Love the colors. And Mark just joining. Ah, welcome, Mark. Welcome, Mark. There's so many watches still. We're only on G, and uh, we've got lots to go. So I hope I can motor through some of these as we go. Next, we've got a Carl F. Bucherer, and it's a Monero auto date. I know less than nothing about the, the Carl F. Bucherer brand. But interesting combination of parts. Looks like it has sector dial elements to it. And maybe you can highlight a bit more about this watch to me and, and explain what exactly it is, uh, where it originates. Is it, is it a traditional piece? Is it something that's a bit more modern? It's a pie pan, is it? Thank you, Sean. That's interesting. So the dial itself is actually raised here in the center. It's very hard to tell in this lighting. But the effect is pretty cool. That that whole sector sector dial effect always always interests me. And uh, just as a casual dress watch, I think it is something. I don't know as as it is the brand Buchera. I really don't know the development and the history of the line and where it sits. So that needs to be researched in the future. Okay, this is from Glenn, and thank you so much for this, Glenn. Next is from Gregorio, and it's a Dan Henry. <laughs> it's amazing how we go from one to the next. So this watch, I really don't know much about either, but I do know it has a VK64 mechanical quartz. <clears throat> it's inspired by 60s designs. It's got a racing strap. Um, I will say that the Seiko mechanical quartz movement is stellar. I mean, it's as much as we bag on quartz, mechanical quartz is a gem. Uh, you can use it hard. You can... Uh, really beat it to pieces and it will still work for you. And the whole idea of having that module of quartz accuracy with a mechanical chronograph function, something quite unique. Uh, do like a combo. I should look into this brand a bit more, but I, I, this watch also gets quite a lot of flack in the community. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to motor through next. This is to James and check this out. This is a Casio Oak in yellow. I think this is just, just awesome. Great combination. And as I get to you here? I'm going to try and keep up. It's a Swiss AD. Okay, from Bucher. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you, Andreas. Slowly but surely getting through these names. I like the Globemaster. Um, what else is going on here? Pure madness. <laughs> I really like this combination, this, uh, this blend of yellow and black. You can never go wrong with yellow and black with a watch, you know? Um, and that's a G-Shock. You want something to stand out and give you quite a punch, and this one does that pretty well. Nice combination of colors and parts. I don't know much about Casio. I know the G-Shock development is amazing. It should be for someone like me in the industrial design field. The whole idea of developing a case that can really take a hit is something special. But uh, I, you know, don't ask me about references and models in the fan, in the family. How cool is that Canary Casio? It's awesome, Johnny. I think it's quite exciting. I mean, you rock this thing when you go running, when you're just out there. Look at it. The real character looks great. I like the fact that it, it highlights most of the time we see G-Sharks, they're black. But when you see them in yellow, you get to see all the little elements and grooves and cuts. And uh, the dial is actually quite beautiful. Can I say that? The dial is quite something. Batons set inside there. Uh, 
lovely digital display, and we've got a bit of an analog display here, analog hands. If I was going for a Casio G-Shock, I would be sure to find one that has analog hands if possible. I think this combination does look good. You don't ever have to worry about a ticking second hand. Great. Really cool, James. Thank you for sending it to me. It's one of the best looking Casios I've ever seen, actually. <laughs> Speaking from a more design-related perspective, fascinating. Okay, next, James. This is from the wristwatch experience. This is a very unique Porsche design piece. It's called an Orfina, and it was in fact designed by Ferdinand Porsche himself. How is that? This was, I think, one of the last watches he designed, or it was in that time when he was getting quite old. I'm so tempted by a G-Shock Neville. It looks good, right? Um, so this is a this is a real classic. I don't know what time period this was this was made. I would imagine Ferdinand Porsche. I'd imagine this was a 70s era inspired model. Uh, but it's just beautiful. I mean, this is when we really got the idea of understanding how he was he was inspired by his dials in his cars, you know? And you can see that how it follows through into the layout here. Very unique. I think this watch did a lot more than most of us would imagine in the field of chronographs and the development. Ferdinand died in 51. I was also wondering in something how how Ferdinand could have designed this watch back then. Unless he actually came up with this idea at the time, I really don't know the full story but uh, I, I know that Ferdinand had been around for a long time before the 70s so it would be nice to get a bit more clarity but this is one of the first Porsche design pieces out there and uh, say what you like about PVD on cases it's all open to interpretation love the highlights and the accents they're great James thank you for sending this in next from Jim another Seiko alpinist whoops a Seiko alpinist spoken about it a lot discussed this watch on many shows before and uh it's a watch that kind of divides opinion down the line. Can you explain what Porsche design is, Doc Baps? It's essentially a, a design house. So uh, I wouldn't say, if we think about car manufacturers, we think about Cosworth and Brabus and makers that are behind the scenes that add emphasis to various cars. Porsche design is more on the side of the accessory line of the family. I don't know the true origins of Porsche design, but it's a design house that focuses on accessories like you know golf clubs sunglasses cell phones um i think they really got their claim to fame when they started working on cell phones and, and things like that uh but yeah so that's basically it it's not got nothing to do with porsche the car manufacturer yes they they're owned by they're, they're an offshoot of the family but they're there to design accessories like luggage and suitcases beautiful stuff i actually applied for a role with porsche design years ago and they wanted to see me, but I'd have to travel. I would have had to travel out into the middle of nowhere where they're based. I don't even somewhere in Germany, and uh, I didn't have papers. I didn't have a passport that would work for the trip, and all sorts of stuff. It didn't work out at the time. But uh, it's amazing how these roles jump up. I think a couple of years ago, I applied for a role at Porsche Design. It would have been amazing though. Anyway, getting onto it. So the Alpinist divided, divided opinion. I, I find it very peculiar. Beautiful shot though from Jim. Love that light, you get that, that green effect. Uh, watch the video I made on the Seiko Alpinist and how it's developed over time. Uh, there's lots of little details you can learn about just how they've improved and how they've looked at the watch differently. Uh, but it's all open to interpretation. Okay, next, I'm, I'm on J. How many more names have we got? Actually, we're doing really well. That's fantastic. We're hitting, we've almost hit the two hour mark at this point and it's decent. We can actually sort of slow down now as the show continues. Fantastic. Okay, so the Alpinist, highly recommend you watch the video because I talk through what like a 60-year development of the brand. I look at from the very first all the way up to the modern modern range. This being the pro, I didn't even realize with the Prospects logo, this is actually the most modern variant. So it has a better movement, has a Cyclops. I didn't even notice that. So this is one of the latest in the family. Seiko is charging a bit more for these pieces, but uh, fascinating. Ferdinand, oh, hold on a sec. Son Ferry, the grandson of Ferdinand. Okay, that makes more sense in something. So the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche created the piece. That makes more sense. Superb. Okay, and uh, founder says, Dan Henry recreated the Orfina in his collection of watches. Did he really? Yeah, I mean, you can tell how backwards I am, trying to keep up with trends while also focusing on stuff to, to write on and, and talk about. Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to satisfy every area, but... As time goes by, I think it will improve. Okay, moving on to Joel. 
Thank you for this uh, submission, Jim. Love the, the color con contrast and the lighting and the effect. To Joel with a Zen 104. I think he sent this to me quite a while back. I love that Swiss flag in the background. Uh, and uh, Zen 104 is just one of those. It's, it's a cult classic at this point. Um, it's just exciting. Uh, Zane saying, did you pick up that watch you haven't shown yet? Um, the watch I haven't shown yet. Have I, how, how would I haven't shown it if I haven't picked what, who would I, who would I? I don't get it. But Zane is, Zane is an important character in this development of the show, would you believe it? Uh, he is, his submissions are at the very end of the show, and I highly recommend you stay because they are the ones that you have to drop the mic afterwards. Um, he's the one who suggested this idea of sharing audiences' wrist shots. And you know, I was expecting 10 wrist shots to be sent to me, ended up receiving 100 and thought, well, let's make a show about it and just focus on what everyone has. So, sorry, uh, Zane, I didn't, I didn't get that. I haven't picked up anything yet. I'm still very much hoping. Yes, I, I said I'm purchasing a watch, absolutely. So I'm uh, in the process of deciding on my first luxury watch. That is the whole, the whole development and the story. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to allude to what I'm thinking about and share a few uh, ideas about the watch that I'm looking for. And it should be a lot of fun. I really hope you enjoy the development of the story as it goes. Uh, but I'm very much aware of what watch I would like to get, which is pretty cool. So anyway, get back onto this while, I mean, we're doing pretty well for time, two hours in and we're still gunning. So Zen 104, cult classic. The audience loves it. It's it's one of those workhorse watches. I love the fact that it stays true to its heritage and its brand and uh, really keeps that aesthetic of, of contrast and needle hands, pilot uh, inspiration, beautiful balance. And again, the, the setting is quite something. So Joel, thank you so much for sending this in. Next from John. So we're still sitting on Jay. We're doing pretty well. Awesome. From John. This is another unique piece. This is a Japanese domestic market Seiko Ninja Turtle with a strap code oyster bracelet. And I really, really like the contrast of the PVD with the, the orange hand as well. Exciting, right? Very interesting. <laughs> the Buganish, a Langenzona. Maybe you'll have to wait and see. I would say it's a bit more exciting than just your, your basic Alangunzona, the Buganish, but we'll let you decide. They definitely are watches to end the show, which is great. Uh, nice, subtle faux patina, dear artifact. I think so, too. It, it's a great contrast between the cream of the skin, the cream of the dial, the black-on-black -black effect, orange highlight. It is super legible if I zoom out. Really stunning on the wrist. And it's that cushion case aesthetic that really does stand out the best. Um, wristwatch experience, thank you so much for joining. As always, it's a pleasure. Uh, pretty amazing that we've managed to motor through a good midsection of the series and we've caught up. So I think... Over the next half an hour, we'll be able to run through these and end the show there. I definitely don't want it to be a three-hour show because then it just gets it gets a little bit excessive. But, you know, it's been some great watches on show, as always. So thank you, John. And next is Joshua with a Citizen NY0040. Have we seen – we saw a watch very similar to this earlier on in the show. And there's some great details that this watch uses, like the way the bezel has been arranged. I think the knurling on the bezel of this watch – is something that more brands should pay attention to. Great looking blend of, of smooth and a surface to grip on. You look at this and you know that when you grip it, it'll turn. <laughs> There's nothing worse than, than a bezel that you can't actually turn with gloves on or anything else. Um, but just love that, the crown being offset. I don't know the, the full story behind Citizen as a brand, but I know they have that same kind of link to, to Seiko in a way. They're in a similar family. So... Yeah, interesting. Underpants style edition, Eric Bell. That's so funny. Is that what they call it? You could call it a, a vest or that is so hilarious. So there we go. Got a bit of a jock strap going. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay, so it's cool. I mean, I don't know anything about the brand. I can't say too much. I haven't learned about the history, but it is the second one. It is the second citizen we've seen so far. And I think they're relatively affordable. We can pick them up. Citizen is Seiko's Tudor. <laughs> wow, Soak 82. That is interesting. Did not did not know that. Um, okay, well, that's some, we learn something every day. Citizen is Seiko's Tudor. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? It's up to you to decide. Thank you, Joshua, for this. And I think he sent me something else. This is a Tissot Le Locle. 
I really, really don't know what a Tissot Le Loc Le is. Uh, you can see it's a half half shot Tuesday, or what do they call it? Half watch Wednesday. Um, but we get to see half of it at least. So there's something. Uh, I don't know much about Tissot as a brand either. They've been around for a long, long time, and they've had their ebbs and flows over the years. Um, love the Romans. Uh, I love I love half the dial. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for sending these in, Joshua. Superb. And next. Next from Julian. And Julian is quite an interesting chap. Now, he sent me a long email, and I actually forgot the context of where he was swimming exactly. But this little sea dweller that he has here is a reference 116600. I think it is. I hope I got that right. No, it can't be. Is it? I think it's a I think it's a five-digit reference. If I'm not wrong, you might have to correct me. Um Le Loch is a clown, uh, uh, sorry, a town in Switzerland. <laughs> Thank you and something. Okay. So this sea dweller has seen this man through for years. Okay. He has worn this watch for over a thousand three hundred dives from Julian. Julian, is that you in the chat? Thank you. Red Sea. Okay, great. You can you can please clarify these things because you've sent some beautiful. This has to be the best contextual photos you'll be seeing in the show because just wait for it. Um, this watch has seen him through about a thousand three hundred dives over the years. I don't know if he's a commercial diver or if he does this for fun or for a hobby, but it's just amazing that you have this watch being used in its context. And then we jump through, and it's just this is just superb. You get to see the full, full Monty, the full effect. It's great seeing a sub in its in its habitat. You know, let's see if I can get a better. If I can just turn the angle a little bit. Was this all in the Red Sea? I think you said you were on holiday. Um, it's so nice seeing the watch actually being used. Great action shot, as uh, Shane says. Uh, sorry, Shane says, and then Zane beneath says top shot. Yeah, it's great. I think it's superb. And then we carry on going through, and we see this is even better. In the reeds, San Diego, got a DUI there. That's awesome. So you're an actual, so you're an instructor. It'd be nice if you could give us a bit more context, Julian. It's superb. It's so nice. In the in the seaweed there, you've got depth. This is the, I'm guessing this is the oxygen counter. I mean, look at that. And the, the crazy thing is, whenever the watch is offset, um, that one's in the UK. Amazing. When this watch is offset, you just can't see a thing on the dial. Uh, it's really only when you have it face up and you're actually looking at it, do you get to see. The full beauty but this is a submariner in the proper habitat where it should be when do we ever see divers wearing the diver in the ocean with their full gear on this is just context galore and superb i would love to see more of these if you could send more of these in future weeks julian that's great because i think it just really brings brings it home shows us where these watches belong and it looks and the crazy thing is after seeing what one and a half thousand dives <laughs> it still looks pristine, looks brand spanking new. And the last shot, check this out. This was also in the Red Sea, I think, but he's got a nice whale shark image. Now, whale sharks, the biggest fish in the world. Correct me if I'm wrong. Diving near Scotland, was this with the whale shark? I don't know. Uh, but I, no, it can't be. These are more tropical based, right? Um, coming from South Africa, all of my buddies go to Mozambique, which is a little bit further north of South Africa. And they go dive with these, and they do all sorts of crazy stuff. They, um, not a sub, sea dweller, sub, you get what I mean, Han. Um, so these whale sharks are amazing animals. They are very, very uh, docile. And there's some amazing photos of people diving with these animals because you can quite literally ride on them, and they do not care. Um, basking sharks from around the UK, is that so? Okay, well, I've learned something new. Um, again, I'm from the Southern Hemisphere, and I just know that these guys cruise. Mozambique is the main place to go and have a look. But it's so nice seeing this habitat, seeing this watch being used professionally in its environment. So thank you so much for these, Julian. I really, I really hope everyone's appreciated it, and it's, it's nice. Next, we're jumping to Kennedy with an Archimedes Outdoor Protect. I know less than nothing about this brand, but I have, have we've, we've seen Archime Archimedes watches before, right? Um, and this also has an olive dial, I hope. hope I'm getting that right. Talk about a field watch. Manages to marry that effect of a field watch together quite well. We've got, a, we've got an integrated bracelet with, with a strange-looking case design with crown guards. It's, it's very sports-oriented, but it has that 
you know, it has that aquanaut effect. It almost has that aquanaut effect, you know, uh, with the way the numerals have been set and rotated around the dial. Not bad. I'm really interested in this watch, actually. Um, being used as something more rugged outdoor. Uh, yeah, superb. I think, uh, going back to Julian's photos, I think it's so nice seeing that kind of context. I'd love to see a, a James Cameron deep sea sea dweller in the, in the water and get a good, good orientation shot around it. So this watch, it's amazing how it takes that idea of sports and field aesthetics and puts it together into one piece. Nice combination. Looks very rugged and usable. Okay, so thank you, Kennedy, for that. And this is Les with a WMT. And in the background, he does mention something about Gibson. So I'm going to try my best and name all these watches in the, the guitars in the background. Um, so WMT as a brand, I don't know if you know about this, but they're big on social media. They basically, I've actually given them a shout out in a video before, talking, the video is about faux patina and Aquanaut, <laughs> Pet Shop Boy. <laughs> so um, what they do is they, they go to the full extent when it comes to modifying their watches. They will, they will rust the hands for you. They will patina the dial to the end of its, of its life, just to give you that effect of faux, faux patina. WMT, Experimental Watch Company. I don't know much about them, but I just know they're very popular on social media. And uh, these guitars in the background, I'm going to just take a wild guess at this. And this is, again, from Les. Being a collector, you know, we love our, our gadgets. And uh, since he's a Gibson man, just, oops, oh, no. I love the Magic Mouse. This, what is going on here? This looks like a J200 Gibson. Don't know. I don't know if this is an Epiphone Casino or if it's a 335. This bass, uh, Hofner Violin Bass, that's what I thought, Eric. This looks like a proper violin bass. This, made, this was made famous by Paul McCartney. It's fretless, and he used it as, uh, during his time in the Beatles. And this looks like a Strat with that, that hippie uh, paint scheme around it. I don't know the name, about it, the name of it. It might be something in front as well, maybe a Les Paul, but I can't see enough. But it's great. I, I mean, I love guitars. I've been out of the guitar game for a long time, but... I have a feeling that's a J200. I don't know if that's a Gibson or if that's an Epiphone, but that is most definitely a Hofner bass with a fretless setup. It's gorgeous. Violin bass is just beautiful. So WMT, strange brand, but I, I recommend you have a look at them on Instagram. It looks like a Gretsch, maybe. Uh, well, I have a Gretsch, and I can tell you I don't think it is because Gretsches generally are a bit thicker. Might be wrong there as well. Um, it's so hard to tell in this lighting. But uh, yeah, I have a Gretsch. What is it? I don't even remember the number of it anymore. Uh, but I, I love guitars. I got into guitars uh, in 2012. Um, I'm a Strat man all the way through. Uh, picked up a Strat after trying every other guitar out there. And the Strat just sung to me. So WNT, interesting brand. Check them out on Instagram. They, they uh, tend to do some pretty crazy stuff. I mean, they literally can tropicalize their dials in a flash, uh, rust their hands. You want the full patina effect. It's the company to look at. <laughs> we make trash. That's funny. Uh, so there's something about the this Harrison, Harrison Rocky. Thought it had something to do with, with that psychedelic period. I mean, the guys were, at that time, they wanted to paint their guitars and just play around. So this does, I was thinking, I was thinking it was a Beatles era related I think that's the idea. He's very much inspired by Beatles. If we have a J200, this is probably a Gibson 335 Hofner. We've got the full Beatles experience. Um, Squire is Fender's Tudor, Cheetown. Hmm. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't think so. This is a Jacques Edro from Mark. I'll get to that now. No, I think uh, Squire is much, I mean, Squire is way, way below. You know, think about it. Uh, the, the finishing and the workmanship on Squire can be so disappointing. And when you're talking about guitars, this is something. With watches, you can get away with lower quality pieces because there's, there's, unless you're interested in finishing and movements and detail, um, with guitars, if you don't get a good guitar, then you're just wasting your time because the best guitars force you to play them. You know, If you get a cheap guitar, odds are you will give up playing it after a few weeks because it's just difficult you know the action is bad the, the plate the neck everything is set wrong the nut is too tall so um, it's important but uh, Squire is made in the same factory as Fender in Korea interesting Mokuzen. 
Yeah, you know, Fender also has its own various attributes. Like some are made in Mexico, some are made in USA. They all have their varying levels of quality. Um, but for me, I've always gone for the USA made stuff. I've got a Martin. Martin was my first guitar. And uh, my dad saying, you're not getting anything but a Martin. <laughs> Best advice ever. When you're learning guitar, get something expensive because you will not regret it. Martin is the Rolex of guitars, as Will said. Martin is just, I love Oh, get me, get me a what's it a D forty eight, D forty two. It's been such a long D forty five. It's another one. Um, yeah, we can talk about guitars in another show. But geez, I'm a fan. Hey? Uh, like talking about Gibsons and uh, my, you won't believe this. My dad had a Gibson Hummingbird in the seventies. Gibson Hummingbird. He gave it away. He didn't know. He doesn't know. I think he sold it, and didn't realize that uh, the value of that guitar now could probably buy your house. <laughs> you know, and he also had a Mark I Lotus Cortina. So, yeah, you know, it's amazing how times change. How, um, what about Gibson Williams watches? I mean, they're superb. They've had some interesting, if I played a Takamina, my dad had a Takamina at a stage in his life. The proper, I mean, I think Takamina originally in the 70s, top notch, they made some amazing guitars. My uncle still has a Takamina, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so yeah, talk about guitars at a later stage, but I just yeah, I just love I love them. I need to get back into it, you know. Anyway, Jacques Hedro. So this is a Onyx Grand Second. It's I I have zero idea about this brand. Uh, just saying that much, but it's it's stunning seeing the offset seconds hand and how it integrates the use of thirds and the balance on the dial is something unique. Love the placement. Let me try and rotate it a bit so you can get a good look. You'd have to squint a little bit to see the time. But uh, really interesting looking watch. Talking about dress pieces, I would like to learn a bit more about Jacques Hedro um, as a brand. It's another. There are just so many of them. We're talking about guitars and everything else. Um, but watches are just the same. There's trillions of brands out there. And Tim K saying Fender. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm Fender all the way through. I absolutely love Fender guitars. Not just for being, I mean, I, th I think, I actually think of Fender being the Rolex of, of guitars for the most part. Because you can just smash them and do whatever you want with them. You bolt them together and just play. But when you think about Fender from an industrial design point of view, uh, they really made an impact in the mass manufacturing of watches, <laughs> guitars. See, I'm looking at watches and I'm talking about guitars. Too lazy to put some indicators on it, the Bouguenish. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult, right? You have to get, if you get really close, you can see tiny little inlines there. Let's zoom in. Uh, I'm just refreshing the stream to catch up. I hope hope there's not too much of a delay. <laughs> you get to see you get to see something there. I think it's it's gorgeous seeing how they've used the space on the dial. Um, rule of thirds and that, that golden ratio and the segment. You can see just how well mathematically it sits. But uh, from from a legibility point of view, it's a bit difficult. You can't. I mean, it would be nice to see a proper minute track inside this, where you could actually count. Sorry, seconds. You could actually count the seconds inside here to see a, a, a good. Time keep. Interesting though. Sometimes sparsity can be handled very well, and I think this is a good example. Um, gorgeous. Next from Mark. Mark again. This is a Vacheron. Another. Geez, we have another generation one from Mark. How's that? Except this is a blue dial. <laughs> That's amazing. And he's sitting drinking. A. Eh? I cannot read that. I'm very bad. Magnificent city. I'm sorry. You might need to. You might need to uh, cover me in the chat if you know what that. Looks like a bourbon. I do not know. Beautiful looking watch. I love the layout. Um, Les Paul is also great. Talking about guitars still. It's so funny. Um, Anthony, if it was me getting a Lat Mount Gay, is that what it says, Paul? Thank you. Uh, rum, superb. So uh, Les Paul, I've I've played a gold top, a vintage gold top, and I must say it is something. There's there's something about proper pickups, you know, double coil double coil pickups that really. Just has that drive. Les Paul just drowns out any other sound in the room, you know. Um, but single coils for me, I just think are so versatile, much more uh, sweet, not as crunchy and hard, you know. Okay, getting back to the watches. So now we've got another generation one, except with a blue dial this time. It looks great though, right? Look at the balance. Look at that size on the wrist. Very dress and sports combined. Um, we've spoken about this piece already, but it's nice seeing it in a, in a different light. Check how they did the bracelet. Hollowed out the middle here to get a, a nice divide between the center link and the outer links, the polish, the brush finishing. 
integrated crown guards. I mean, they really were trying to do all sorts of things back in the day. And Mark sent me a few watches, and there's, he's, he's more of a Zenith man. And he has all sorts of Zenith pieces. So this is a, uh, let's see, it's called an auto sport. And I mean, can you get any more 70s than this piece? Late 60s, 70s. <laughs> Still more talk about rum and, <laughs> uh, let's see, this is great. And, and Ben, it's a pleasure. It really is a lot of fun doing this. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. We've chatted about all sorts. No Rolades, <laughs> truth is. That's funny. Um, beautiful looking watch. I love the combination. There was, there was chat about, we, we spoke about the 18, what's the reference? The 8313, the, eight, the, the A3, whatever, the, the Rake Edition Zenith El Primero that was released, uh, re-released. And there was talk about the use of the numerals around the dial here. There's something about this sharp, aggressive setup that really, it draws your eye in when you look at the dial. Not the A384, the A318, that, that one, Philly's dad. What's it? The A813 something. Or other. It's the blue dial variant. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> but... Um, I think these these numerals, or the minute track, is very charismatic. And if you squint your eyes, it, it pulls your attention closer into the dial, brings that pleasant that that presence in. You know, blue highlights around the place, uh, offset date window. I mean, this is just so zenith at this point. This was what they did with all of their watches. Um, I would imagine, since it's auto sport and it's automatic, this is the El Primero movement in this watch. It's just not a chronograph. Very interesting. I mean, again, I have to emphasize, I get these watches and often I don't even get time to look at them. I save them and just carry on with whatever I'm doing. The A3818, that's it. Thanks for these, Dad. Um, okay. Next is another, Zenith Defy. And this is one of the original Zenith Defies. And you can just see that, that old school television case. Uh, really interesting. I didn't even know that Zenith made the Defy back then. I mean, that's how, how fresh I am to the hobby. <laughs> uh, the Zenith Defy I think about is the, the Jean-Claude Beaver um, explosion of DNA all over it, you know. Um, really nice, though. Really old school. I like the way that the, the dial has been set into the case, and the case just fills that space so nicely. Neat and tidy, you know. Forms well around the segment. Um, so it's really cool. Another great one from Mark. And there's another Zenith uh, Elite chronometer i don't i don't think he gave me a name for this watch so i'm just reading on the dial this is beautiful breguet numerals check that out i'm going to leave this on the screen for a second i hope that's okay while i catch up with all of you while hitting the coffee because i literally haven't touched coffee <laughs> the whole show zane you're a legend i must thank you so much you gave a suggestion a few months ago saying why not do a show talking about people with watches on their wrist or just what no why not just highlight wrist wrist shots and it really turned into this series and i have you to thank for this whole segment so it really is a pleasure uh, the burgundy is saying what's my preferred liquor or spirit i love wine i'm actually a big wine person red wine for me is is it whether it's a shiraz a merlot uh wherever it is from in the world i guess growing up in south africa that's where i'm from originally um you know, Stellenbosch is one of the, the main places in the world to get your wine uh, ne next to Australia and California and France. And oh, it's just, you, you learn to develop such a palate with wine. The richer it is, the more fruity it tones. I could go wine tasting every weekend if I got the chance. So that's me. Um, I do enjoy whiskey, but, but wine for me is if I had a choice. And it, it mellows me out. I think whiskey, whiskey with coffee gets me zonked. <laughs> with wine, I can sort of mellow out and get into the show a little bit better when it comes to presenting and everything else. Uh, SA Red is great. And they, it's so stupidly expensive, this side of the world, Jimmy. It's depressing, actually. The same wine that you could get there if you're living there. <laughs> uh, you, you come overseas, and all of a sudden, it's five times the cost. But that's the case. I mean, it's a huge industry there. Okay, beautiful looking Zenith. I've never seen this watch before. We have a superb, a 50 hour power reserve, sub seconds. We've got Breguet numerals. We've got the offset date. I don't know how, actually, in, in this case, when we're talking about asymmetry, the offset date really does work quite well with this piece because everything is asymmetrical. I've said this before that um, when you're dealing with asymmetry, the best kind of models are ones that follow through with asymmetry in all the places. So like Jean, we can talk about Jean in the, in the future, but 
I think this whole idea of offsetting and keeping everything offset is what allows it to look balanced. It's quite ironic, you know. Um, let's see what uh, what Clive says. Great to have you here, Clive. Welcome. Uh, had a nice daughter, nice a nice daughter with your your dinner. <laughs> uh, told her she looked like uh, okay. Thank you, Clive. That's and that's it. Hey? I mean, uh, it's all about it's all about family. It's all about love. Uh, there's nothing better in this world. We love watches. We love these things. But and at the same time, whether we follow these trivial pursuits of careers and whatever else, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all down to family and your loved ones because that's what matters at the end of the day. I, I love thinking to when you are on your deathbed, you're not going to be thinking about, oh, I overspent on this watch or I should have done this and that. You'll say, you know, wish my family was here and, you know, it's great. <laughs> and then... Uh, yeah, Clive's talking about toilet paper. That's got to be the stupidest thing I have ever, ever heard. The way the media is portraying this story at the moment is just so pathetic. So we're actually getting up to, to two and a half hours at this point. So maybe we'll run as close to as close to three hours as possible without going too far in. But uh, yeah, let's keep going. We're on Martin at the moment. We're on M. We have a few more, and there's some great watches still to come. Everything from the simple to the more complicated uh Irish whiskey. You know, truth is, I've tried whiskeys in my coffees, and it just doesn't do it for me. Huh? It really doesn't. I think it just, it's that, it's that undertone. You get it on your tongue, and you know that you're drinking whiskey in the coffee, and it just kind of ruins the, the whole flavor for me. But then if you have enough, you're hammered, and you don't have to worry. So dear artifact, yeah, welcome. You're still here, brother. So this is a 36 mil courtesy of Martin. It's a 14270, and it looks the way an explorer should look. And look at this photo. I love the puzzle pieces. I mean, how creative can you guys get with these photos? It's stunning, right? Um, and Ron says, really don't enjoy drinking anymore. I feel the same way, actually. Uh, I, I do it very, like, you know, once or twice a month at this point um, because it, it kind of slows me down. When I'm doing these shows and I, <laughs> and I do drink something, I kind of feel quite, quite hit the next day and think to myself, uh, maybe, maybe alcohol is not the best call for a show. Like tonight, I'm just rocking water and, and coffee, and that's it. So, yeah, it's it's Clive's favorite watch. He loves this piece. And Tim, 2 a.m. in Germany. That's so funny. Yeah, I mean, I what, it's, it's half past 12 in the UK. Uh, it's great. I mean, the, the content is cool. You get to see such a nice variety. We're going to have a look at more Seamasters. We've got a Lunga coming up. We've got a, a Hulk sub. It's some amazing, there's some beautiful photos as well coming up just now. So I highly recommend you stay. You're going to enjoy this. So... Like I said, the surprise Air Force watch of 2018, as Clive says, uh, funny story. I love the fact that this thing has been worn and used and scratched to pieces. It is what an explorer should look like. You know, uh, it does less than nothing for some, but for others, it is one of those watches that uh, that is so low key and under the radar. <laughs> God, I love that. That was real history. And uh, anyway, so. This, so this is from Martin. Thank you for sending it in. And this is from Matizius, and it is uh, the Vacheron overseas Gen 3. I freaking love this watch. It is so beautiful, man. The, the way they have pulled their thoughts together and really made – and look at the photo of this, you know? Um, the way the thoughts have been pulled together and made this watch into what it is now as a Generation 3, the blue dial – uh, polished, brushed segments. You get to see the bracelet, <clears throat> how the bracelet has been arranged to mirror the Maltese cross. Look at the detail. Oh my goodness. I mean, how can you not enjoy that? It's just, it's stellar. So the Gen 3, I think, is becoming quite popular. I wish the prices were dropped a little bit, ever so slightly. I know it's Vacheron you're dealing with, but it's sad that uh, they can't, you know, cut the price a little bit for the middle guys. Beautiful photo, though. This is absolutely stunning. So, Matt Zeus, thank you so much for sending this in because uh, the layout is superb. I love the lighting. You get a good, good understanding of all the elements. Nice highlights. Um, Anthony says, Tim Mosso, sprinter. <laughs> you guys, long distance stayer. <laughs> I must say, Tim, uh, I love watching his stuff, but he talks so fast at times. And uh, I kind of, it kind of catches me off when I hear him taking a breath every couple of seconds. And I think to myself, Tim, just slow down. We're not going anywhere. You can take your time. Um, I'm learning. I'm learning over time to you know, start speaking slower and uh, get into the presenting a little bit better. 
but uh, yeah, superb. And I've also noticed, I don't know if that's a scuff or a scratch. <clears throat> I don't know. That's a bit rough. But this watch has been worn. And I mean, that's the point. You don't wear steel watches uh, not expected to get scratched. But it is beautiful. We've seen Gen, we've seen two Gen 1 overseas today. And this one is, I think, the closer of the Vacheron line. And there's mention that VC is greater than AP. Ron the Shrink, I think it definitely stands at least shoulder to shoulder with them. But I've said what, what made this watch so unique in the family is that even with the Nautilus and the Royal Oak, they were still able to make this and quite literally create an icon in that family. To suddenly bring out a watch that now vies directly with watches that have been established since the 70s. You know how crazy that is? It's like for a brand to suddenly come out and compete directly with Nike and Adidas for shoes. It's nuts. Um, for that reason, I think Vacheron deserves our attention. I made a video. I think that's what I called it. The Vacheron overseas deserves your attention and gave a full, full talk about the development of the history. And the blue is, is beautiful. Um, got scratched while tunneling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. So thank you, Matazeus, for sending this in. Next from Matthew. And this is a Seiko 5. I don't know much about Seiko 5, so forgive me. It's a SNZG07. Great shot in the light. We've got a nice polar effect. Very, um, very field watch based. It looks like one of those, those pieces that was inspired by the field watch. Nice depth to the dial. If you notice how, how the, the minute track steps in to the numerals there. Uh, it's got almost like a cream finish. And I think he sent me another one. This is a bit more of a natural. If anyone is, is into botany, it'd be nice to hear what this flower is. Um, my mother's quite big in botany, so it'd be nice uh, if someone could give me the scientific name on <laughs> this reference. Uh, too big, truthful, truth feel guilty says. Now, if you're talking about this watch, I, I have less idea than a goat about Seiko 5s. I just know that it is, it's popular. It's another one of those cult watches on this platform. It's a rose, Tim. You're kidding. Is it really? Was I just a fool? That definitely does not look like a rose to me, but could be right. I don't know. It looks like a European flower, whatever it is. So <laughs> uh, that's a start. But uh, I, great, great looking layout. And the Seiko 5 was supposed to be this, this watch that segued people into the, into the watch hobby at a time. I really don't know. <laughs> Tim, thanks. Thanks for the clarifying that. Seiko Sunday. It's always in red. Oh, that's it. That's another like, characteristic of Seiko. They, their Sunday is always red. Uh, technically, Sunday is the first day of the week. And I think Japan uses it as their first day of the week. I do not know. Anyway, carrying on here. Max with a Seiko Monster. This is a Generation 2. I really dig this watch. And he sent me two of them. So let's, let's have a look. I think he's in a plane when he takes the shot. I think this, if you just squint your eyes and you look at the dial, this is what epitomizes the monster. Um, you get to see that, that teeth aesthetic. It looks like a mouth that's open. It's very, I mean, it's, it's so ostentatious and just like violent, <laughs> you know? Um, it's definitely not a watch for everyone. It's very overstated. But I think as a character in the Seiko family, hell, they're just having fun with this. So, I mean, it's a watch to be enjoyed. And uh, also too big from two fears. Yeah, I mean, these watches are just oversized. They're monsters. I mean, I, I like the idea that the name corresponds with the design of the, the dial and the watch itself. Um, just as, as a piece in the family, I think this is the best uh, character of the line. I think I made one about, I made a video about the monster before and called it something like, should it be loved or feared? <laughs> and I like had a shark and everything in the background. It was really cool. It's a nice thumbnail. But I enjoy the fact that it's a watch that, that tries to go a little bit out there and tries to be, yeah, it's my nightmare, the Bougainish. Yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone for sure. Um, it's, it's very stylistic and fun. It's like, it's like a Casio. You know, you go out, you have fun, you enjoy it. You really beat it up. It's nice seeing that the watch has been worn and it's been scuffed in places. Cool. Go to the gym with it dive, swim, do whatever. This is from Mike next. So thank you, Max, for this piece. And uh, next is from Mike, and it's a Breitling Hercules. Sadly, the resolution is not the best. And me with Breitlings, I, I, am, I am terrible <laughs> with Breitling references. So, uh, you know, you can give me some more details about this. But I do like the name. They have all kinds of crazy, like, like Super Ocean and Hercules and Emergency and B01, as Tim K says. But this watch is it's not new. Uh, I think it's 
it's a part of the line that it's it's been discontinued over time. Breitling seems to try and bring their oh come on, magic mouse work with me here, baby. Uh the Breitling seems to incorporate these these compass bezels into their watches often. And yeah, whether it's a hit or miss, I don't know. As a chronograph, you know, they're trying to play on that Navi timer history and the development. Uh, but it's a sports watch. It's definitely someone's take. I don't know how Breitling stands nowadays in the community. Would like would like to know actually. It's nice to see that level of variety and that Mike enjoys this piece. It's nice and legible. I can tell you that much. You look at the dial and you see the layout. You can really tell the time easily. No. Um, and it's nice seeing an integrated bracelet. There are some cool watches in the Breitling line, but it seems like they're getting more popular with um, uh, their, their reissues for the most part. Okay, carrying on. Thank you for this, Mike. Next is Nine Bolts, and he sends in a 214-270. This is a Mark II. We've seen a Mark I already on the show, but it's nice seeing the, the one that has been loved uh, let's see what's going on here. It's nice seeing you guys chatting in the background. Um, the watch gets the distance between the subdials right. Ron, talking about this, this Breitling. Yeah, I agree. Legibility on the dials, nice and symmetrical and clean. Very easy to read at a glance. And I think Breitling does that well with a lot of watches, except you know some Navi timers, they really don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to catch up with you guys for a second. Could you get an Explorer one without waitlist at an AD? Are you talking about me specifically? You know, I could go into, into Swiss, what, Watches of Switzerland and maybe try my stuff, but probably not, no. <laughs> watches of Switzerland, are they even a Rolex dealer? I don't know. Uh, you can find them. You might be lucky. Um, I'm, I'm using a magic trackpad, Clive. This is, this is the magic mouse. This is the, the one with all the, the, vibe, the motors inside it and stuff, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't correspond to me all the time. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you can, you can find these watches at ADs nowadays if you're lucky. Um, they are still available, and you know if you go in and you, you kind of give them a good story and say, my great great grandfather was Edmund Hillary, and yada yada yada, really blow smoke. You might be lucky enough to walk out with these pieces. It's not too much of a wait time with this watch compared to others in the line, if I'm not wrong. Uh, waitlist is shorter, the, yeah. The waitlist is shorter though on Explorer One. That's it. So um, there isn't. I mean, you can have a, maybe a week or two week delay with this, where with modern sports in general, you get stupid waste of time you know um anyway carrying on with this it's great seeing all this especially rolades <laughs> yeah, it's funny how how everyone seems to be falling out of love with the brand and uh i just enjoy it because there is some good history behind it and as sports watches go there's some cool stuff to talk about this watch to me as much as i really love the simplicity and the details i mean this watch is seriously a top contender on my on my list of first luxury watches to get this these numerals just don't do it for me you know they just they feel too modern for a watch like this and the 39 mil size it looks too big for me uh, this the presence looks a little bit too big uh when i see 39 mils i want it to be a little bit more compact and have a bezel possibly or whatever else rb thank you so much from india welcome to the show okay carrying on we are, we are getting quite close to the end which is great this has been a long show but uh, we've just passed two and a half hours at this point and we're doing pretty well this is also from nine bolts and it's a seiko navigator check this out got a cushion case got a this is an eerily reminiscent royal oak related bracelet how cool is that and then we've got a gmt complication inside it looks like a fixed bezel inside there but uh really enjoy the cushion case this looks like something straight out of the 70s, the 80s, that kind of era. Um, anyway, love that blend and that balance. I'm just catching up with all of you guys here. It's great. There's just chats about all sorts of you know, Rolex, most, most Rolex discussion. Okay, so interesting looking piece. Like that combination. Uh, this looks like a watch that should be brushed, but it looks quite highly polished. I don't know the time period when this watch was made. I would imagine 70s era. But it's nice seeing that presence on the wrist and the balance and uh, easy to read at a glance, as you would want. Okay, moving on. Nine bolts, thank you for your two pieces. This is from N something, and I hope he's still here, but otherwise, this man really knows how to rock it. He's a huge... So the pieces that he gravitates towards, JLC and Moser. And this is a Geophysic True Second. 
So for those of us in the community who really don't like quartz watches, there he is, he's here, superb. For those of us who really don't like quartz watches, this piece is probably one of the most accurate watches out there. It has the same effect as a quartz watch, but it's fully mechanical. It's a crazy complication. But it's, I think what makes this watch so beautiful is that it uses these, these pencil hands. Very reminiscent of, uh, when I think of these hands, I think of the Amiga um, Globemaster, What's it called? The Pipan Globemaster, you know? Geophysic, yeah, that's it, Clive. <laughs> uh, they do use the faux patina effect on the, the tritium plots. Uh, I don't know the story behind the geophysic. If this was a recreation of a certain model in the family, but they incorporated this new movement, it's an amazing movement. I mean, that's why people buy this watch. It's got a, it's got a crazy story behind it. Uh, but the idea of having a watch that is fully automatic but wears and, and actually ticks like a quartz piece, love it or hate it, it's a bit peculiar, right? Um, but it's nice, as Dear Artifact says, the loom color against the dial. You have this, this cream effect that blends with the white finish. Really nice. And it's so understated, you know? Uh, it's almost like you could, you could rock up with this and know everyone would just think it's a normal watch. It's actually funny. I mean, people could probably mistake this as a Timex because it ticks the way it does and it just looks like a watch. Uh, meanwhile, it's a JLC and you turn it around and it's an absolute masterpiece back there. So thank you and something. This was one of the last submissions. I was able to grab it about uh, 20 minutes before the show started. Uh, special model in 1958. So this is a recreation of a model from 1958. Thank you and something. So I'd love to look at and something's collection in the future because his watches are stunning. Okay, next from Orange Hand, and check this out. I think he tells me that he doesn't wear this watch often, but it's a Doxa 67 Cobalt F1. And I love this. <laughs> it's like, do you want a watch that really sums up the 70s, like a racing track? You've got it right there. Orange Hand. Orange Hand only owns Orange Hand watches. If I'm not wrong. You can correct me if you're in the chat. But... Just you have everything. You literally have a racing dial. You've got a flag. You've got the the typical 60s, 70s era baton layout on the dial. You've got a bit of gray, a bit of white highlight. It's so peculiar, uh, but really is a, a watch of its time with the racing strap. It's just it's just nuts. And he's actually got the original advert. How cool is that? He's got the original advert in the background. This looks like the hang tag with it. I don't know if this is a recreation of it or if it's if it's new or, or old. I really can't tell you, but interesting though, right? I don't know if he's still in the chat. I mean, this has been going on for quite a while, so <laughs> uh, he was here earlier. Great though. Thank you, Orange Hand, for this. This is superb. And uh, I can smell the John Player special. Is that a John Player special? It is, sure is. Is it? No, it's not. I don't know. I can't tell. Black and white photos, man. Would this be? Uh, I really can't tell. I don't want to say anything that's wrong on the show, but this really was a... But I love the era of Formula One. It's so nice seeing the history and the development of Formula One in general. Um, anyway, carrying on from Paul. Now, I think this is a really special one. Uh, you're doing pretty well with the time. Orange Hand is still here. Superb. You have five of six have orange hands. That's so cool. So there we go. Straight out of Orange Hand's mouth, five of the six watches he owns has an orange hand to it. So he loves orange hands. Moving on. This is a very special watch. This is from Paul, and he sent this to me basically saying this is his pride and joy. Um, the whole, it's taken him, a, this was a watch to celebrate a very big anniversary or a business venture, I can't remember the story, but he's had this watch for a long time. I think he said 10 years to me, and he just loves this thing. All rose gold, beautiful big subdials, and look how legible this watch is. I can pull this right back, and you can still tell the time pretty well. Um, it is beautiful though, right? I love that black on gold contrast. Check it out. Nice and simple. And Daytonas generally are always about bling and flash. But when they actually, when there's a bit more thought that's gone into the batons, the hands and all those details, all of a sudden you have something that's actually really legible. And Hans, yes, it's full rose gold. So this is his pride and joy. He specifies, I think he's had this for over 10 years at this point and he's, he's never grown tired of it. And there's something special about that, you know. You aspire, like I said in the beginning of the show, with um, with Ben and his his Patek Seven Five Seven One Two, this Nautilus. When you aspire to own something and you eventually get it, it's just 
it's just great. And you keep it for that long period of time. No date, truth is. You don't want a date on a Daytona. Ugh. I just, it just doesn't work, man. It just breaks. I mean, as it is, the Daytona, if you look at the way the subdials have been arranged, you've got, you've got them pushed up already. There's no, there's no true symmetry to the dial. So if you have a date, where would you put it? Like on the four o'clock position here? Ah, I don't think so. It's funny how Rolex likes to stick to what they've done all the way through their time period. Anyway, beautiful. Love the combination. Thank you for this, Paul. Really enjoy it and good health. Next is from Rajko, another Seiko 5. Jeepers. So this is a 7009. Again, don't know much about Seiko 5s. Um, but it's one of those watches that gets you into the hobby. People really enjoy it. It's it's a cult watch on this this channel. I mean, on this page on YouTube in general. Um, interesting, and I like the I like the contrast between the gold and the steel and the, the way the case. All of these watches look so different. You know, you have you have these integrated cases, and then you have watches that have more typical styled cases, and then you have some that have more seventies motifs. It feels like their their designs are all over the place. Cheap and cheerful, Okazen, exactly. Um, interesting, though. So it was nice. Thank you, Rajko, for sending this in. Nice texture on the dial, too. Really cool detail. Okay, we're getting through slowly. We're almost, we're, what, like, how many minutes? 18 minutes before we hit the three hour. Carrying on from Reed. A must de Cartier. Now, Reed, I do apologize. You sent me a good description on this watch, but I just saved it and just moved on. So this watch is in nine carat. I think it's plated gold. As we know, Master Cartier is, is a bit of a, a, a more affordable variant of the tank. But uh, this was special. I think it was gifted to him by his wife for an anniversary. And it's quartz, as we know. But um, these watches nowadays, you can get them easily, right? And it's, it allows you to get the tank on the wrist. I really do like that, that dial blend with the, with the gold finish and the strap and the combination. Reed has some cool watches. Nice and uh, nice and simple, and I can see that this watch has been worn over its life. That's great. I mean, I really love watches that show a bit of life to them, you know, that have, that have seen a few things. I think it's very special. So, Reed, if you're still in the chat, thank you so much for sending this through. Um, much more Seiko cases. Yeah, yeah, Richard, you're right. Um, interesting. Thank you so much for this, Reed. Uh, it's cool talking about it. I'd love to do more uh, discussions around Cartier in general. Um, I love to look at the tank a bit more and, and the story behind the name. Okay, now we're carrying on. We've got a few more names here. We're doing very well. Richard got some real heavy hitters here. How was that? So I, this was one of this was an early submission. I don't know if Richard's in the chat at the moment, but we've got the full setup. We've got a, a Royal Oak offshore. We've got a really cool Speedmaster, and we've got another Daytona. I think this is yellow gold. I don't have the references on hand to tell you, but Really nice looking offshore. It has to be one of the best in the family, actually. Uh, very legible. You can actually see it nicely, see the balance on the dial, the layout. Again, with the Omega, uh, we seldom see these watches that have these Paul Newman esque aesthetics, you know? Um, and the balance is superb. You get a nice, a nice highlight of the minute track. You get the batons. I don't know how well the batons and everything would be in, in direct light. Is this, a, is this considered a Schumacher Speedy from Ron? I, I really don't know, but they are they are cool. I think the inspiration was taken directly from that later era chronographs and pushed into these modern pieces. Looks great. And then we jump over to the Daytona. I think this is pretty much the epitome of a Daytona at this point in time. Um, nice contrast. Well, there's not much contrast actually, but nice uh, combination of elements. Very flashy and blingy and stands out there. So it does what a Daytona is supposed to do. You know, Mr. Perpetual Yellow Gold. Yeah. So it's nice, what I like here is seeing, yes, he loves his chronograph. It's nice seeing how these three brands are quite representative of each other, you know? Um, that's an offshore Navy themes from Clive. Isn't, don't, you have a similar watch to this, don't you, Clive? Uh, I don't know if you have the chronograph version. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I must say that the noir contrast here is very good. A little bit of a red highlight here in places. So we have, what, 44, 42, 40. Great balance and very wearable every day. It's nice. I mean, that's all you need for a collection, right? I uh, mentioned that the AP looks huge. It does look massive, right? If I zoom out, I mean, this looks like a cell phone <laughs> compared to these two. Uh, it's crazy, but I, I really do like that blend. It's nice seeing these watch representing the brand, these watches representing the brand well. 
Next from Riley. We're 15 minutes until three hours, so we're doing pretty well. How cool is this shot? This is from Riley, and it's a Speedmaster reduced. That is stellar. I really like this combination. Don't, don't talk about the size, but just the color scheme and the way it fits and the way it looks. Very interesting combination. And the photo is just superb. You know, Junior on Junior Johnson had to take a break. Yeah, we just roll through, man. We're still going and uh, going to hit the three-hour mark, and we're going to work out something. But this is really nice. I love the combination. A great shot as well. Thanks to Riley sending this in. Uh, great panda aesthetic. I'd love to see this watch with black subdials as well. Um, but the Speedmaster reduced, I don't think should be should be dismissed, because uh, as we know, the Speedmaster at forty-two doesn't always suit everyone. I personally, when I wear a, a 42, I've, I've worn a couple of professionals before. It looks just, it, it visually for me feels too big on the wrist. It's uh, the lugs overhang ever so slightly. There's not enough bracelet to, to case size, you know, no good blend. With the reduced on the other hand, you get a nice balance between the parts and uh, it all depends on your size of the wrist, obviously. Um, but it's really nice seeing this, this combination and yeah, really nice contrast there. Look at that, great details. And I have, I've been trying to keep uh, keep in touch with the chat, Omega. Uh, let's see if I can see what else is going on here. Tim, Mo Tim Mosso said it was, damn it. Uh, didn't, didn't get that, Clive. But it's, it's great. I like the fact that you're chatting amongst yourselves and uh, you know, I'm keeping you entertained. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna carry on through. We're doing well, we're pushing. Next from Robert. This is a Rhodium Yacht Master, I think. This was in a boutique, and I don't know if Robert likes putting nail polish on. This might have been his wife or girlfriend, or I don't know. Maybe he's a rock star, and he, and he likes nail polish. But uh, these, these rhodium dial pieces are something quite special in the Yacht Master line. I think they're going to get very popular, because as we know, nowadays, sports Rolex is, is very... Uh, <laughs> very difficult to come across. People are saying fluid gender. <laughs> That's so funny. Hans. Yeah, I really don't know. Uh, it looks like a woman's hand, though. You can't, uh, I don't think it's a male's hand. Anyway, speaking of which, I'm just going to say it's a rock star's hand. Uh, these, these pieces are very much going to be quite important nowadays since we can't get our hands on sports pieces. And this watch offers a lot. It's quite a sleeper, you know? I love the platinum bezel and uh, the size and the proportions, the use of, of highlights of colors. I mean, this is a place where it seems like Rolex is trying to make their sports watch a little bit more exciting, a little bit more fun as it is. Okay, so Robert, next. Thank you so much for this, Robert. Oh, same, same Robert sending in the next piece. Seamaster Professional 300 on a rubber strap. And this is a great combo. We get to see the, the great white in its natural habitat. Actually, no, not in the direct light, I should say. It's great seeing it on the rubber strap, though. We seldomly see this watch paired with that piece. The contrast, I don't know how well it works, the sizing and, and everything else, but I think it's a great piece. It's really one of those watches, I've said already in the show, that I think this piece is one that offers immense value for what you're getting. Uh, the white dial is just so attractive. It's It's got that polar-esque aesthetic, but you've also got a bezel, so it's functional. Um, great contrast of parts depending on which on whether you could wear this watch or not with your wrist size that's up to you i found that a lot of people buy these watches and end up selling them like six months later because they can't fit them on their wrists but it really does like like uh, william said looks great on rubber i think it does it tones it down a little bit more and it does reduce its visual size as we know if you want a watch to wear big you wear it on a bracelet but on a strap it makes it look a lot smaller and this ceramic dial let me pull this right in so we get a good look I think they did an amazing job with the ceramic dials, um, but that's also a divided opinion because they don't like the reflective quality and, and all of that stuff. Uh, and then we talk about the wart on the outside, like we said earlier. Um, it's all up to interpretation. I think it's a watch that has managed to do a good job in, in becoming modernized over this period of time. We'll be looking at the Piers Brosnan era and all of that stuff. Um, great looking watch though. And thank you so much for sending it, Robert. It's nice seeing, we've seen a few Seamaster professionals on the show. Next from Russell, uh, and, oh geez, <laughs> I didn't even look at the caption. Uh, this is one of the showstoppers for the, 
for the episode this week. <clears throat> so if you're on Instagram, highly recommend you follow this <laughs> highly recommend you follow this guy. He has such a beautiful set. I checked out his his watches. <laughs> follow his account right now. He has a Scuderia Ferrari, so that's his his username, Scuderia, basically. So he has this is called a Zeitwerk Phantom. <laughs> and uh, the next watch he has is a full perpetual calendar royal uh, Nautilus. What he does, he has a very small collection from what I've seen, but the collect the watches that he has are the, ech the upper echelon of what you could get from each. <laughs> okay, so go on Instagram and follow this guy because you won't be disappointed. The photos are incredible. Just scroll up. I put the I put his name in the chat for you. And uh, so next to this watch, he has a perpetual Nautilus. You know, the one with the full symmetrical dials? It's just insane. Um, I would love for Russell to contribute more. <laughs> this is just incredible. Look at this. I mean, it's neon. So this is a this is a uh, Zeitwerk, which is one of the most complicated watches that Lange makes. It took years and years of development to get this. this developed. There, Russell's in the chat. Fantastic. 996. Thank you, Russell, for joining. Um, the whole idea of this watch being one of the most complicated in the family and uh, the fact that they've gone the extra length of actually ghosting the, the dial to make this lumen. I mean, it's just the phantom. I mean, it's so exciting and slick, modern and retro. And yeah, compared to the standard Zeitwerk, this, this, <laughs> this does it a bit better for me. I find it, it this feels a bit more modern, you know, the, the, the Zeitwerks we see normally with the white dials and the, and the gold and everything else. They look a bit more classical, grandfather clock inspired. This one, this one just jumps the line and says, hey, I'm modern, I'm in. I've never seen this watch before. I've never even heard talk of this watch before. So Russell, thank you for sharing this. I didn't even know that uh, the Zeitwerk Phantom was a thing. I do love the, uh, the datagraph lumen. That's the one that really stands out to me so much. Um, I've handled the datagraph. That's the one longer that I have handled and I just adore. But this piece is amazing. So, Russell, thank you for sharing this. This is mind blow. There's some great, there's a great few watches at the end, but this is this is one of the top killers by far. So, thank you again, Russell, for this. Okay, we are slowly but surely coming to the end of the show, and we're doing pretty well. Next is from Sergio, and he's rocking. Check at that color setup. He's rocking a Hulk with beautiful flowers in the background. Don't uh, don't ask me what they are, but I love the the fact that the sweater matches and. It's, I mean, this is a Hulk in its natural habitat. How beautiful does that look, though, right? I think it looks great. What a great shot. Um, I've had my, um, my ups and downs with the Hulk. I'm sure most of you may know. Some of the first videos I put out, I try to discuss watches a little bit differently. And I said that the Hulk is, is too green <laughs> and that the bezel, I think, could be worked on a bit more. But, you know, it does have its place, I think, as an anniversary piece. The dial on this watch is just phenomenal, as we know, the, the reflective quality of the dial. Your colorblind marker. So this is actually gray. That would that's that would be cool. For those of you who don't know, if you're colorblind, you can't dis, you can't really distinguish between red and green. So it generally comes up as gray in your spectrum. So hell, a, a gray looking sub would be pretty cool. So that's almost like a full patina, you know? Stunning. So thank you so much, Sergio, for this. He sent me another piece as well. But I love this 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 photo with the flowers and, and the sweater. It looks so good. Next from him is another speedy reduced. Oops, magic mouse. Another Speedmaster reduced to 38 mil. Look how tight those proportions are. I've never seen this variant of the Speedmaster reduced. It's 38 mils, beautifully balanced. When you look at the dial, you look at the, the layout, the, the use of the minute track around it. It looks so legible. I just kind of wish they put white, uh, white paint on the, the hands on the subdial just to tighten it up ever so slightly. Because as it is, the subdial seems to, you know, you lose, you lose the subdial in the light or the hands in the light but i love the size i think it works really well and it's nice seeing just how integral everything looks it looks very different to the standard speedy pro but uh nice contrast and thank you again sergio for sending these in next from steve we've got a q timex and this is <laughs> i think he titled this uh this photo uh cheap and cheerful so uh, it's great i mean Say what you like. I think it's just so entertaining that they decided to bring this watch back. Uh, but in saying that, now it's it's become quite the the community watch <laughs> that everyone's jumped on lately. 
Um, and Timex is just now mil trying to milk it as much as they can with like a Batman inspired variant. And this should have just been the watch that they made and just left it. But now, of course, we're going to get the full Monty. We're going to get uh, Cokes and we're going to get Hulk. We're going to get a Hulk variant of this watch next and, and all that. I just think it's fun, funny. Uh, you can't take a watch like this seriously. It's just, I mean, it's, how, how much do they cost? Like 50 bucks or something? I don't know. Anyway, carrying on. Supersonic Hippo. If you're still in the chat, this has got to be, this is such a gorgeous picture. Check this out. This is the most high-res picture I received today. Gorgeous little pit bull. And you've got a Tudor resting on his forehead. I mean, that is just so freaking cute. <laughs> and we zoom in and we check out the dial. This looks like an ETA because it has the smiley self-winding, has the rose. So I'm guessing this is uh, an ETA variant. But I just love the, the setup here. It's just precious. Dogs, man. I, I love dogs. You could just, just send me, I think, watches and dogs in future. Please send me your dogs with watches, and that should be a show by itself because, yeah, I'm a huge dog, uh, dog, dog lover. <laughs> it's, been, it's been three hours, guys. I'm, uh, I'm backing off here. Uh, no need for a safe, Hans says. That's so funny. Yeah, and these, these dogs, they get such a bad rap, you know? Pit bulls are the most precious animals if looked after. It's whenever it comes to owning a dog, it's it's the owner. The owner is responsible for the animal. If the if the animal is in the wrong shape, it's not the dog's fault. You know. Okay, so beautiful. And uh, I don't know. The dog trainer loves this photo. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I mean, I've always been a huge dog fan, and it's precious. So thank you for sending the supersonic hippo. Um, beautiful, beautiful little Tudor. Great setting, beautiful photo as well. Next from Sriram, we've got another, geez, we've got another Alpinist, jeepers. So it's an SARB 17. As we know, we've chatted about this watch a lot. It's good seeing it again on the show. Um, and I'm very divided on this watch, as I said earlier on the show, but it's nice seeing that people are reaching out. This is one of the originals, no prospects. So it's it's the simpler version. We've chatted about it a lot, but this is a nice a nice scene of, having it in a matte layout. So you get a good idea of the dial and, and everything else. Next, and this is from Turek. And IWC Chrono, I think we checked this out last week. But this is, look how good those numerals are on the dial. So this is a pilot chronograph. And we've already had a look at a separate IWC Chrono earlier. But these, these numerals really do something, really calls back to those World War I era pieces. Stunning. Uh, sword hands, the, the whole layout, I think it's just nice and clean and beautiful lighting. He really got a good shot. And I think he sent me another few. Nice offset angle. <clears throat> IWC, get an IWC and get a pilot watch from the family, you know? Um, <laughs> Lawrence, can't send a photo of you because I don't own one. Yeah, well, all I can say is uh, the, the thing is save up as much as you can. Put a little bit of money aside every month and you'll be surprised as to what happens over over time. Um, typical expenditure and other things you can put aside. And you can, you know, we're not biased here in this space. We like to be, uh, we like to be open with the watches that are on offer. And I think it's great because as a community, we get to see a lot. The date is a no-no, Soak says. I think the issue, <laughs> it's quite an issue because it, it contradicts the, the balance on the, the sub-dials and everything else. Um, but the color scheme is there. I think it's great. And as an everyday wearer, I think it's nice because you get a, you get a date to use. So stunning, nice balance. And I think he sent me another one. Check how beautiful that dial is in the light. Coffee, coffee, sunburst effect. And keeps those Flieger aesthetics and calls back to, to watches of the 1916 era, you know, World War I time period. Okay. So Tetley next with a Longines Ultrasonic 76. Now Tetley is, is generally always in the chat. So... And he says that his wife hates this watch, but he loves it. Um, it's, it's just cool. You know, 70s aesthetic. You can't go wrong with a watch that just looks like it, it fell right out of that time period. Um, stunning. And you've got a day-to-day complication. Typical balance on the dial. Nice nice contrast. You get to see the, the quality of the details there. Um, Ron saying, thinking of ditching my big pilot after getting the Zen 104. That's amazing, Ron. Really? Is that what you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all up to personal preference. Uh, I think this, this hobby is really about experimenting and, and thinking deeply about what we like. And um, 
what appeals to us. And what I love about this, this whole series in general is that we get to see such variety. We've seen Vacheron first gens. We've seen Seiko Saabs. We've seen everything from monsters to hulks and Rolexes and Amigas and the whole deal. Okay, we're getting close to the end. We've just hit the three hour mark. So I'm going to slowly but surely get through. So thank you, Ted Lee, for sending this in. Send our regards to your wife and say that she just needs to get a grip. It's just a watch. <laughs> it looks cool. Uh, watch and pray next. This is cool. This was sent to me quite, I think, yesterday. <clears throat> and it's a reference 116518. And because it's in precious metal, it's, it's a very recent model. Um, it has an Oyster Flex strap or bracelet, however you want to call it. And this watch has to be one of the most legible in the family at the moment. Look at that balance on the dial. I think this is yellow gold, not rose gold. This is an extremely legible piece. And there's talk about how this piece is almost the neo Paul Newman in a way, uh, because it uses elements like, I mean, I didn't even notice this, <clears throat> red seconds hand running up, uh, nice red highlights around the minute track. And then you've got these beautiful subdials where you can just read at a glance. You don't have to, you know, squint your eyes to see it. Reverse panda, yeah, very much so. And then you've got the black on gold contrast and a black strap to complete it. It's very neat. It really is a sports watch in this stance, the way it presents itself. Looks good, right? Okay, so <laughs> catching up with all of you guys. It uses elements like oxygen, it's yellow gold. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, really nice. I think, I think it's a great contrast. It looks exciting. It looks fun, playful, you know? Uh, really interesting blend. We've seen lots of Daytonas. It's amazing. I mean, you guys with your Daytonas, how, how on earth do you manage to afford these things? <laughs> it's insane. Okay. Okay. So now next we have William. As we're coming to the end of the show, there's some really, I highly recommend you stay because these last few watches are the ones that are in the show. Uh, William with his little OP 11600. Last week he did the same thing. He's got this beautiful green neon light in his um, solder kidney. That is so funny. <laughs> so uh, he has these, yeah, I think he has a man cave and in his man cave, he has a, a bar or something. And he's got this neon light that plays on the dial. And he's got this beautiful champagne oyster perpetual. Look how good it looks with the neon on top of the loom. It's great, right? Looks so awesome. William's normally here, so he might shout out and say, say hey to all of us. But it's, it's gorgeous. I mean, an OP oyster perpetual it just does what it needs to do. It's a watch that's, that really epitomizes the brand that it belongs to. And uh, the loom is just stunning. I think he's got another. There we go. Here's a more direct loom shot. How great do those double batons look? That looks superb, eh? Uh, you very seldomly see this watch glowing in the dark. And we talk about asymmetry and, and everything and, and balance and losing your orientation on a dial. This with the double batons really helps your orientation. <laughs> He's still here, Williams watches. That's amazing. Um, so it does look awesome. It really does look cool. I do like the double batons. You know, it reminds me of Lunga. Lunga and their Saxonia do this with a couple of their references. And this has that same kind of feel, but this is a beautiful photo. I love that effect. This champagne, last week he sent in the champagne variant, uh, champagne, the same model in, in different lighting. And you got such an explosion of color from this, from this dial. And seeing it in the groove, what am I saying? And seeing it in the green of the, uh, the neon, it looks beautiful. It looks radioactive. You know, I think it is a 30, uh, 34. The reference again is 116000. So it's a, a 116,000. So thank you, William, for that. And now to finally end the show, ladies and gentlemen, we've got some stellar pieces from Zane. And I don't know if he's still here. Once again, I'll say that Zane was pretty much the person who said, why not do a show uh, or do a segment of the show highlighting, um, highlighting people's wrist shots? And yeah, he's got some cool pieces. And what happened was this is just catapulted into a whole series where we get to share our watches and have a look at them together. And the next pieces belong to the man who gave me the suggestion. So, okay, number one from Zane, we have a Patek Philippe, beautiful, astronomical. I, I, don't, I couldn't even find the reference of this watch because I was just so busy <laughs> compiling all of this stuff together, but it's just stellar. I mean, I'd love to know more details about this piece. And it's not Zane from One Direction, Hans, no, I don't think so. Uh, let's see, Teti's saying, is this show even longer than the last one? Come on, go for a four-hour hunger buster. <laughs> no, I, I want to try and 
I wanted to uh, to keep it to two and a half hours, but you know the names are just so long. Uh, ended up ended up being a three hour. It's a beautiful looking piece, and uh, it's only five hundred thousand dollars on sale. Marco says, "Are you you being serious?" It's I, I, this this is I know they're extremely rare, and uh, we must vote for a winner. Well, that would take another hour of time, of course. Uh, but this is just insane. I mean, I don't know what goes into making this watch, what, what goes into the dial and the details. I don't even know what it does exactly. It has a date complication. I love when Patek uses their external hands and stretches the length of the dial so you get to see those details. Does this, oh, I think I know what happens here. The moon phase corresponds with the dial and it's got its, it's, got its full like rotational pull. It's got its full compass set up. If, if Zane is still here, it would be great to to here but i have a feeling that this watch basically the, the actual cosmos follows the phase of the moon over time it's just insane like it's just above and beyond me this is the one watch that that is above and beyond me so zane the man who suggested this show to all of us it's just beautiful that's the sky above geneva okay i see marco so this is the exact sky above geneva that is fantastic and yes it follows the sky that is just amazing okay well, this is one of the top, for sure. <laughs> Do they assemble the watch in space? Yeah, I, I would not know. But it is just beautiful. And the next two are equally as stunning. So are you ready? Next, another Patek. These are all Pateks, actually. We have a reference 5270. So this is our double split chronograph. This, this is a double split. Just beautiful on the strap. And uh, I did a video about this. It wasn't seen by many, but uh, I called it Black Beauty. So go into the, open a separate tab and type in Black Beauty, and you'll see the story between how Patek developed the 5959, which was the, the precursor to this and other generations. And this is the modern variant, which is your split timer. So you've got a Ratrapunt here, I think. I'm not the best with complications, but a double split 5270. Uh, you know, it's, it's the 5170 on steroids. So you've got those beautiful Breguet numerals. Uh, the dial is just so clean and concise. Beautiful photos as well from Zane. Thank you so, so much. And uh, we black beauty, exactly. <laughs> it's just gorgeous. And uh, I've learned over time that email means enamel in French. So that's good to know. I'm learning bits and pieces slowly, but it's just beautiful. This is the only variant, if I'm not wrong, this is one of the only variants in Patek's line that uses enamel on their dials fully. I mean, it is just, it's one of those watch. It's a showstopper. It is just beautiful. Uh, rather go with the Zeitwerk. I know, Ron, it is, the Zeitwerk Phantom is stunning. I actually think the Zeitwerk sort of pips, the, pips these watches at the end. But then we have one of the best photos of the show, I would say. They are the best of the best, Marco, I think. Uh, and what I love so much about collectors who can wear watches like these, I mean, this one kind of does draw attention to you, but this kind of watch really doesn't. It's not a Richard Mill, you know. It's it's a watch that uh, is casual enough to be worn that no one outside of our hobby would really know about. And it's it takes a level of commitment and enjoyment. It's not a, another Nautilus, another this and that. It's just superb. Single split, thank you for that. Just discontinued, wow. Okay, next and last but not least, a watch that I really enjoy. And here we go. My favorite little stainless steel beauty, 5212. There's been lots of talk about this watch. I've had a few friends saying that they're on the list and they're waiting. Actually, Fahim, or King Flume, uh, who I mentioned earlier in the show, he had the, uh, the Explorer 2 and the Unimatic, NASA. He just missed out of this watch uh, at the end of last year, and he's kicking himself for it. But uh, yeah, you know, stainless steel and this whole historic, I love watches that have a bit of history behind them, you know, so inspired uh, to move forward with this and, and incorporate the, the handwritten text and all those. I just see a super chat from Thomas. Thomas, thank you, brother. Uh, such a pleasure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sending in your pictures. And that's it. I, I hope I've said that enough times in the show. But in the beginning, I said thank you all so much for, for doing this because we get to see so much variety in one sitting every single time and i really hope this starts pushing the show further into the future where we get to see just more and more variety i love it so uh dear artifact says my favorite of zane i love the inner dial and and i think ron said it's growing on me 
So it's a watch that is very polarizing, and I'll, I can end off the show since we've just gone past the three-hour mark. Uh, it's a watch that I really think is true to Patek form. If, if I had one complaint about this watch that I'd love to improve is if they could incorporate a, a separate hand for the date instead of having the date hidden behind a wheel, a window, or if the window itself was properly color matched to the dial. That's the only improvement I'd like to make to this. But I love the fact, like I said a second ago, when Patek is able to use the full dial, any dress watch is able to use the full dial and a separate hand to highlight its specific complication. So with each hand, you know that that's your day, Thursday. With this hand, you know that you're in January and you're what, the third or the fourth week? I mean, it's brilliant. The fourth week of the month. I don't know exactly how that works. Well, the fourth month of the year, since we're breaking it up. The fourth week, sorry. The fourth week of the year. I don't know how that works with, with, with uh, you know, when, when the period changes and we have different weeks and different months, when you have a leap year and all of that, for example. But it is just stellar. It's, and what the best thing is of all is that it's stainless steel. It looks like an everyday watch. No one in their right mind would know what this thing is. Many would probably mistake this for something just like a, uh, you know, a watch that you could buy for 500 bucks. But it's, it's really interesting. And every day, every day you look at this watch, so the dial changes, the handset changes, it moves somewhere else. So top. I think this is one of, one of my most favorite watches from the Patek family because of it. Um, and it's nice seeing just how they take the inspiration and use it with a piece like this. Just the stepping on the, on the lugs and all of those little details. I think I saw a super, thank you so much for the super chat. And I think that was Mr. Perpetual. Oh, such a pleasure. And Marco, absolutely. I mean, you guys, you guys really are the greatest for being able to submit this stuff to me and for us all to sit down and enjoy. I mean, I love the high res stuff because you can just get right into the details. We can all sit back and enjoy this together. I hope this has been a great distraction from the world around us, you know, and Buganish, handwritten dial. So I don't know the full story behind it. I think maybe Zane could clear it up for us if he's still here. But um, the idea was it was a certain member in the, in the team, in the watchmaking team that used his handwriting for this. And for some reason it was pushed forward and they, they thought it was quite a nice tribute to the watchmaker. I think the watchmaker was retiring or something. And they wanted to do something special and use his handwriting as the as the layout. And what makes it great? I know it's it's quite kitschy, some might say, but it calls back to that '30s aesthetic because, as we know, uh, numerals were hand painted and handwritten on lots of watches at the time. For that reason, I think that callback just ties it. I mean, look at look at the Sunday. You can see there's a heavier line weight on it in places and. Calls back to all those 30 motifs, but it's just a, a superb complication and everyday wearer. So subtle, but fantastic, as Zane says. Yeah, so it's been a pleasure, everyone. Uh, we can run another wrist shot week come uh, close to the end of the month, I would say. We're going to try and do it twice a month. I don't know what next week's theme is going to be for the show, but it's generally like a philosophical talk of some kind. But yeah, you guys are great. I mean, all of you. The submissions have been out of this world. The level of detail, the, the photography, the quality. I'm so glad that the show has taken off and everyone is so entertained by it because we really get to see the whole deal. And last time I actually ran through each watch individually and that took another hour or so. So what I'm going to do is just, if you have uh, epilepsy, I apologize. <laughs> I'm just going to flick through everything quickly as we run back to the top. And uh, everyone is logging out. So thank you all for joining. I'm going to just slowly but surely pan all the way up some kind of way. While I read your comments, many of you are saying thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. I thank all of you uh, for doing this because it really is down to you who have contributed. Last but not least, this Ming, which was the cover photo for the show, belongs to Tree, and it was the watch that stole the show. I think the colors for me are just beautiful, and that's why it became the cover photo. Uh, just absolutely stunning. So everyone, thank you all so much. I'm going to try and close this up somehow, some way. Uh, let's stop the screen share. And I'll once again say thank you all so much for joining. It's been a pleasure. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And as it goes, you're going to continue doing this. Continue sending me your watches. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be posting on the community page when we're going to do another one of these weeks, possibly end of the month. And we'll see how it goes from there. But until then, 
please take care of yourselves. Uh, again, boost your immune systems, vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, zinc, get some potassium in maybe. Uh, toilet paper helps too. That also helps with your health. <laughs> and uh, don't listen to what the media has to say about all of this stuff. Do your research and listen to doctors. Please listen to doctors. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> That's all I can say. And tequila. You need 70 proof. You need 70% at least alcohol to help sterilize. But anyway, enough of that. Take care of yourself, everyone. Thank you all for joining. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers for now.